section sixty seven of greece and rome this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the world's story volume four greece and rome edited by eva march tappan section sixty seven why ovid was banished ten a d by maurice baring this is an imaginary letter purporting to have been written in rome in the days of virgil and horace the old question why the poet ovid was suddenly banished from rome to a land of barbarians is here answered by the suggestion that he criticised the verses of the emperor the editor my work or rather the business which called me to rome is now accomplished and the caryatids which i was commissioned to make for the pantheon of agrippa are now in their place but in what a place alas they have been set up so high that their whole effect is lost and the work might just as well be that of any roman bungler the romans are indeed barbarians they consider that as long as a thing is big and expensive it is beautiful they take luxury for comfort notoriety for fame eccentricity for genius and riches for wisdom or rather they deem that wealth is the only thing that counts in the modern world and here at rome this is true their attempts at art are in the highest degree ludicrous yesterday i visited the studio of ludius who is renowned in this city for his decorative work he paints walls and ceilings and the emperor has employed him to decorate his villa at naples his work which is not devoid of a certain talent is disciplined by no sense of proportion it would not be tolerated in greece for a moment owing to an extravagance and an exaggeration which so far from displaying any originality merely form the feudal mask of a fundamental banality the man himself wears his hair yards long like a persian and favours a pea-green toga i could not help saying to him that in greece artists took pains to dress like everybody but to paint like no one last night i supped with Messinus at his house on the esquiline let me do justice to my host and give praise where praise is due here are no jarring notes and no foolish display Messinus has exquisite taste his house is not overcrowded with ornaments or overwhelmed by useless decoration by a cunning instinct he has realized that art should be the servant of necessity everything in his house has a use and a purpose but where a vase a bowl a cup a chair or seat is needed there you will find a beautiful vase a beautiful bowl and so forth Messinus himself is bald genial and cultivated he looks older than he is and dresses with a very slight affectation of coxcombry his manner is a triumph of the art which conceals art he talks to you as though you were the one person in the world he had been anxious to see and as if the topic you were discussing were the preponderating interest of his life as i entered his hall i found him pacing up and down in eager conversation with agrippa the famous admiral my ears are sharp and i just caught a fragment of their conversation 
which happened to concern the new drains of rome yet as Mecenas approached me he greeted me with effusion and turning to agrippa he said ah here he is as if their whole talk had been of me we reclined almost immediately the fare was delicious and distinguished by the same supreme simplicity and excellence as the architecture and the ornamentation of his dwelling there were many celebrities present besides agrippa ludius the painter most grotesquely clothed several officials and politicians cinna grophus three minor poets horatius flaxus propertius and crassus ovidius naso the fashionable writer virgilius the poet and many young men whose names escape me naso is by far the most prominent figure in the roman literary world at present he is the arbiter of taste and sets the criterion of what is to be admired or not heaven forbid that i should read his verse but there is no doubt about the flavour of his conversation which is more interesting than his work the literary world despises virgilius the only roman poet living worthy of the name on the other hand they admire this crassus who writes perfectly unintelligible odes about topics barren of interest he has invented a novel style of writing which is called symbolism it consists of doing this if you are writing about a tree and the tree seemed to you to have the shape of an elephant you call it an elephant hence a certain chaos is produced in the mind of the reader which these young men seem to find delectable if you mention virgilius to them they say if he only knew how to write his ideas are good but he has no sense of form no ear for melody and no power of expression this of course is ridiculous for although virgilius is a writer who has no originality his style is felicitous delicate and lofty and often musical in fact he writes really well with regard to the other poets they are of little or no account horatius flaxus has a happy knack of translation propertius writes amiable sentimental stuff and tibullus babbles of pastures but they are all of them decadent in that they none of them have anything to say and they either display a false simplicity and a false archaism or else they are slavishly imitative or hopelessly obscure at first the conversation turned on naval matters it was debated at some length whether the romans needed a fleet at all and if they did whether it should be a small fleet composed of huge triremes or a large fleet of smaller and swifter vessels agrippa who has the great advantage of practical experience in naval warfare was in favour of the latter type of vessel but another sailor a friend of cinna's who was present and who was also experienced said that the day of small vessels was over the conversation then veered to literary matters ovidius a little man with twinkling eyes carefully curled hair and elaborately elegant clothes he has his linen washed at athens excelled himself in affable courtesy and compliment to crassus whom he had never met hitherto he had always been so anxious he said to meet the author of odes that were so interesting although they were to him a little difficult i am afraid you must be deeply disappointed said crassus blushing he is a shy overgrown youth with an immense tuft of tangled hair and a desperately earnest face no said ovidius i am never disappointed in men of letters i always think they are the most charming people in the world it is their works which i find so disappointing 
everybody writes too much he continued and what is worse still everybody writes even the dear emperor writes hexameters they do not always scan but they are hexameters for all that it has even been hinted that he has written a tragedy of course it doesn't matter how much verse a young man writes as long as he burns it all but our dear master's hexameters are preserved by the empress she told me herself with pride that she often mends his verses for him and they need mending sadly because so many stitches in them are dropped but how delightful it is to have a literary emperor he was good enough to ask me to read him a little poetry the other day i did so i chose the passage from the iliad where hector says farewell to andromache he said it was very fine but a little old-fashioned i then recited an ode of sappho's perhaps the loveliest of all of them he seemed to enjoy it but said that it was not nearly as good as the original and that he preferred that kind of song when it was set to music what the original might be to which he alluded i did not ask as i have always held that a monarch's business is to have a superficial knowledge of everything but a thorough knowledge of nothing and therefore i say it is an excellent thing virgilius that our dear emperor is aware that you and crassus and myself all write verse it would be in the highest degree undesirable that he should know so much about the business as to command you to write verses of society and myself to write a georgic but you will say he is a poet himself and the empress mends his verses it is true she mends his verses but she also mends his socks and a sensible monarch no more bothers to write his own verse than he bothers to make his own socks or else what would be the use of being a monarch but again you will object if they are written for him why don't they scan the answer is simple the man who makes them knows his business and he knows that if they did scan nobody would believe that our dear master had written them and in having his verse written for him by a professional and a bad professional i hope horatius it is not you by the way the emperor displays not only sense but a rare wisdom for a gentleman should never bother to acquire technical skill if he loves music let him hire professional flute players but do not let him waste his time in practising ineffectual scales and if he wants poetry let him order a virgilius an epic and if he wishes to pose as a literary monarch let him employ our friend horatius to write him a few verses without sense or scansion although i am afraid horatius would find this difficult you are too correct horatius that is your fault and mine we write verse so correctly that i sometimes think that in the far distant future when the barbarians shall have conquered us we shall be held up as models somewhere in scythia or thule by pedagogues to the barbarian children of future generations horrible thought when rome falls may our language and our literature perish with us may we be utterly forgotten my verse at least shall escape the pedagogues for it is licentious and yours crassus i fear they will scarcely understand across the centuries but o virgilius the spirit of your poetry so noble and so pure is the very thing to be turned into a bed of procrustes for little dacians you are unfair to the emperor said virgilius he has excellent taste in poets certainly said ovidius but not in poetry the conversation then turned to other topics the games the new drains the theatre of balbus the naumachia and the debated question whether the emperor was right in having caused vettius polio's crystal beakers to be broken because the latter had condemned a slave who had accidentally dropped one of them 
to be thrown into his pond of lampreys and eaten the sentence would have been carried out had not the emperor interfered and caused the slave to be released horatius said that vedius polio deserved to be eaten by lampreys himself but ovidius and ludius considered the punishment to be out of all proportion to the crime agrippa could not understand his minding the goblet being broken as there were plenty of goblets in the world cinna said that the slave was his own Messenus considered that although it was a reprehensible act and such deeds created dangerous precedents nobody but a collector knew how terribly severe the provocation was we sat talking till late in the night i cannot write any more but i have just heard a piece of startling news ovidius naso had been banished for life to some barbarous spot near taurus the reason of his disgrace is unknown hail end of section sixty seven this recording is in the public domain section sixty eight of greece and rome read for librivox dot org rome part six rome under the caesars historical note the use of the name caesar changed and instead of being simply a name it became a title of honor julius caesar and the eleven emperors who next succeeded him are known as the twelve caesars their reign extended to ninety six a d those following augustus ruled in perhaps much the same way that any ten men taken at random and made masters of unlimited power might have done tiberius and caligula were despots of the worst character the latter at least was probably insane under claudius forty one through fifty four a d colonies were founded in britain nero was a man of fine education and some natural talent but his tyranny and almost incredible cruelty became unendurable and to save himself from death by scourging he committed suicide galba otho and vitellius were in turn placed upon the imperial throne by the army vespasian's reign was marked by war in judea under his son titus jerusalem was destroyed and the treasures of the temple were carried to rome titus afterwards completed the Colosseum, which vespasian had begun it was during the reign of titus that the eruption of vesuvius occurred which destroyed pompeii and herculaneum he was followed by his brother domitian whose rule was so execrable that after his murder the senate struck out his name from their records and even cut it away from the monuments he had set up many statues of himself and because the christians refused to worship them they had been terribly persecuted end of section 68 this recording is in the public domain section 69 of greece and rome this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. the world's story volume four greece and rome edited by eva march tappan section sixty nine the fall of sejanus twenty seven a d by s baring gould in a d twenty seven the emperor tiberius withdrew to the island of caprii and left rome in the hands of sejanus his chief minister and trusted favourite never suspecting that this very man was secretly plotting to gain the throne himself the editor sejanus might flatter himself that he had but to put forth his hand to pluck the fruit which he had laboured to gain the empress livia was no more the julian house was desolate his enemies and opponents drusus the son of the emperor agrippina and her sons nero and drusus were swept aside the only representative of the julian house as yet untouched was caius caligula agrippina's youngest son then living under the care of his grandmother antonia and of the claudian house was tiberius gemellus the grandson of tiberius but he was a mere child the senate lavished honours on the favourite of the emperor coins were struck in spain bearing his effigy beside that of tiberius an altar was erected to friendship with the representations of tiberius and sejanus on it as neither the emperor nor his minister came to rome 
the senators the knights all solicitous of obtaining favours crowded to campania to obtain interviews with sejanus who was harder of access than his master this augmented his arrogance as long as sejanus remained in the presence of the prince at caprii it was impossible for any one to open the eyes of tiberius to the treachery of his favourite minister for he controlled every avenue by which access could be had to his master all the correspondence passed through his hands but the conditions were altered when sejanus went to rome sent there by tiberius but for what reasons we do not know a late authority perhaps for the purpose of drawing a lively picture describes the parting the emperor embraced and kissed him weeping and exclaimed that he felt as though he were losing a part of himself as yet no suspicion that sejanus could be unfaithful had entered the mind of tiberius if there had he would not have sent him to rome where he commanded the praetorian guard on reaching the capital the great vizier was received with abject respect his busts and portraits were everywhere exhibited side by side with those of the emperor and like sacrifices were offered before both men swore by the lucky star of sejanus as they did by that of tiberius two golden seats were placed side by side in the theatre one for the sovereign the other for his minister a decree of the senate invested both with the consulship for five years and required all future consuls to model their conduct on that of sejanus already in the society of the nobility tiberius was spoken of as the king of the isle and sejanus as his tutor crowds assembled before the palace of the favourite elbowing themselves into prominence fearful of not being noticed or of being noticed too late it flattered the son of the volsinian knight to see the proud nobles cringe before him and he observed their countenances attentively dio cassius says truly enough men born to honour do not set such store on outward demonstrations of respect and do not resent lack of respect towards their person so keenly as do new men because the former know well that their worth is properly appreciated by others he however who struts in borrowed plumes lays the greatest stress on outward demonstrations and holds as a galling slight any carelessness or neglect in the attribution of honour consequently people are more on their guard to show honour to new men than to aristocrats by birth for these latter consider it rather becoming in them to disregard an act of discourtesy whereas the former consider it such as a challenge to be resented with all their might if the enemies of sejanus proposed to excite the jealousy of the prince by their exaggerated homage they gained in part their object the emperor who addressed him as his companion in the labours of government repeated his former order forbidding divine honours to be paid to himself or any other man but tiberius did not mistrust the minister he was vexed at the baseness of the roman nobility he had nominated sejanus as consul for the ensuing year and had finally yielded to his persuasion and consented to his betrothal to the princess julia if a god had declared how sudden and complete would be the transformation of affairs at this time says dio Cassius, no one would have believed him on the last new year's day when all the sycophants in rome poured to the palace to offer their best wishes and presents to sejanus a bench gave way under those seated upon it and when the great man issued from his doors a cat ran across his path when he offered sacrifice on the capitol so dense was the mass of people there packed with a wave of his hand he signed to his attendants to take with his litter the traitor's way and the gemonian steps down which the bodies of criminals recently executed were cast and the bearers slipped and fell as they bore their master it was noticed that ravens croaked and fluttered above his head and perched on the roof of the prison on reaching home sejanus cast incense on the altar before an ancient statue of good fortune and so it was said afterwards the goddess turned her head from him sejanus had made himself too many enemies and enlisted in his cause too many confederates for his safety the moment he ceased to keep guard in person over the prince women had helped him in his crimes and women brought him to his punishment 
after sejanus had left caprii tiberius had sent for his grandson tiberius gemellus and for caius the youngest son of germanicus to be with him and divert him in his solitude antonia the grandmother of caius the daughter of the triumvir seized the opportunity to dispatch a letter to the emperor confided to the care of her most trusty servant pallas and in this letter she made tiberius aware of the cruel manner in which sejanus whom he had trusted had betrayed his interests and wrought the dishonour of some of his family but the letter told something more that sejanus had gone to rome to ripen his deeply laid schemes for a coup de main which would subvert tiberius and enthrone himself the scales fell from his eyes and the old man saw plainly at last how he had been deceived sejanus from the tenor of a letter received by the senate from the prince began to suspect that some forces were working secretly against his interest confident in his own powers of cajolery he resolved to return to caprii and meet these antagonistic influences and break them he asked permission to leave rome and revisit his master alleging as his reason that he had heard tidings that julia his betrothed was ill the desired permission was refused the prince said in reply that he himself proposed to come to rome which was true under the circumstances tiberius believed he could trust none but himself the position of the old emperor was as alarming as it was difficult he knew that a large party of the most influential families in rome were hostile to his government either because they clung to the phantom hope of a restoration of the republic or were attached to the cause of agrippina others he had reason to suspect were so involved with sejanus that they must stand by him at all costs sejanus was head of the praetorian guard and he had brought his men together to the number of ten thousand and established them in a permanent camp on the most salubrious portion of the heights which radiate into the esquiline viminal and pincian hills to what extent the soldiers were likely to obey their commanding officer against himself and their oath that tiberius could not conjecture he made out a new commission over the praetorians and gave it to macro an officer of his guard and dispatched him at once to rome tiberius wrote to the senate to say that he was very ill and that he had not long to live then sent tidings that he was better this was probably true he was thoroughly unhinged by the discovery of the treachery of sejanus and by his nervous terrors in one letter he praised sejanus and then dropped words of blame so that the favourite was himself perplexed and did not know what to make of these extraordinary communications his anxiety says dio cassius did not drive him into open rebellion nor indeed had he sufficient confidence to stake all on an appeal to arms every one in rome shared his uncertainty the result of these conflicting tidings every one hesitated whether to pay homage to or to shrink from sejanus it was expected one day that tiberius would be on his way to rome and the next that his death would be announced tiberius now dealt a master stroke he commended caius the youngest son of agrippina to the senate and the people as his successor he reckoned doubtless on the enthusiasm which this announcement would produce among a people who had still the greatest love for the memory of germanicus and the people received the decision of the emperor with tumultuous delight this was a fresh blow dealt sejanus who had reckoned on himself succeeding tiberius he felt instinctively that his chance of an appeal to the soldiers and to the people was cut away from him it was noticed that in the imperial orders the minister was named sejanus without any honourable prefix contrary to the former habit of tiberius but occasionally tokens of favour were shown sejanus was nominated along with caius to be priest in a college of which the emperor was himself a member and tiberius allowed the senate to confer on sejanus as it had formerly on germanicus the proconsular power bewildered by these contradictions in the behaviour of the prince cast from an extremity of hope to one of despair uncertain about himself and those who surrounded him sejanus let slip the opportunity of taking that decided and bold step which tiberius had dreaded the emperor had played with him as with a fish 
till he was ready to land him this craft was a necessity under the circumstances but on october seventeenth a d thirty one nivius sir torius macro arrived in rome late in the evening with his commission to supersede sejanus in the command of the praetorians still uncertain as to the result of an appeal to the soldiers tiberius had caused to be circulated a report that sejanus was about to have the tribunician authority granted him which was equivalent to his appointment to be regent along with himself all rome believed the tidings sejanus elated with pride considered that he had reached the last step but one to sovereignty his followers were filled with exultation and those who had lately hesitated to show him honour crowded about his doors to offer their tardy homage macro on his arrival in rome betook himself at once to the house of the new consul regulus known to be hostile to sejanus and summoned thither to meet him Gricinus Laco, commander of the seven cohorts who acted as the night police of the capital and were lodged in barracks in the different quarters of the city to the consul and the commander of the cohorts macro communicated the emperor's private orders and prepared the requisite measures the decisive blow was to be struck next day a session of the senate was appointed to meet in the morning at the temple of apollo near the imperial palace on the palatine hill as macro was on his way thither at daybreak he encountered sejanus also on his way to the same point surrounded by a large retinue of servants clients and friends a suspicion of evil crossed the mind of the minister at the sight of macro whom he had supposed to be in caprii he asked him eagerly if he had come from the emperor with letters to him and was answered in the negative sejanus changed colour and halted macro noticed his alarm and drawing him aside whispered that he was the bearer of a dispatch to the senate relative to the tribunician authority for sejanus the minister in great delight hastened to the place of session with head erect and face beaming with expectation all present saw in his bearing a confirmation of the rumour that had reached their ears and starting from their seats pressed round him with their congratulations these he received with gracious condescension macro had not entered the senate house as soon as he had seen the last flicker of the scarlet shoes of sejanus as he passed within he announced to the division of the guards sent to keep order and to the praetorians who had attended the minister that the command had been transferred to himself to the latter he promised a gratuity from the emperor and bade them withdraw to the camp they obeyed without demur then promptly and silently the police under laco surrounded the place of session when this measure was complete macro entered the temple and delivered the imperial order then retired before it had been opened in order to make the best of his way to the praetorian camp and secure the fidelity of the guards the scene that ensued was probably the most dramatic that had ever occurred in the senate as soon as the imperial messenger had left the assembly they proceeded to open and consider the letter it was long and verbose it began with comments on matters of no vital importance and then proceeded to blame sejanus but the words levelled against the minister were not written consecutively but were mixed up with remarks on other matters of public business then came a whole paragraph devoted to sejanus and a categorical demand for his impeachment on several grounds the letter concluded with requiring the arrest first of two senators closely allied to sejanus and then of the minister himself tiberius renewed his declaration that he proposed returning to rome and stated that as he was surrounded by enemies he required the attendance of one of the consuls for his protection the letter was written by the emperor in a tumult of nervous terrors and with his mind unhinged by loss of confidence in the last man to whom he had clung and in whom he had believed the reading of this letter struck not sejanus only but the whole senate as a bolt from heaven the consternation the bewilderment were general and the greater because the senators had just vied with each other in adulation of the man who was thus struck before their eyes those who sat nearest him rose in silence vacated their seats and placed themselves elsewhere 
and the praetors and the tribunes of the people stepped into the empty places to surround the doomed man and prevent his escape but the suddenness with which he had been hurled from the highest pinnacle into the abyss was too great to allow sejanus to exercise any presence of mind and decide on what was to be done he sat looking stonily before him unmoved the consul regulus rose from his seat and ordered him to stand up sejanus heard but did not comprehend what was said this was not due to pride says dio but to the fact that he was unaccustomed to obey the order was repeated and repeated a third time by the consul in louder tones and with upraised arm sejanus dost thou hear me he asked then as though roused from a trance the unhappy man replied what do you call me he slowly rose looking round for some one on whose shoulder to rest but saw laco captain of the police with sword unsheathed before him and knew he was already a prisoner and a lost man now ensued a scene of basest most cowardly recrimination from all sides rose hoots curses abuse the wildest expressions of pent-up jealousy hate and thirst for revenge and loudest of all yelled those who had crouched lowest but half an hour ago to kiss his hand those who had been his closest friends made themselves now most conspicuous as his enemies nevertheless the consul did not venture on an accusation of majestus as he could not calculate on the strength and determination of the party of sejanus in the senate they might combine in the danger that menaced all through their head he demanded a formal charge to be made on which he might proceed legally to arrest sejanus one senator rose and in a shrill voice above the tumult impeached the minister thereupon regulus at once ordered laco to remove his prisoner to the dulianum the capitoline prison the whole proceeding was precipitate so as not to allow the adherents of the fallen minister time to concert measures of resistance already tidings of what had taken place had spread like wildfire through the city and when sejanus came out between the guards on the descent of the via nova to the forum he could see that the entire space was filled with an agitated sea of heads his way led down the slope the dip in the hill under the porta mugianus past the temple of jupiter stator and the height now crowned with the convent and covered by the gardens of st sebastiano on reaching the bottom of the hill the road turned sharply to the left above the house of the vestals for a while hope flattered him a vestal virgin might come out of the doors meet him and thereby obtain his reprieve if not his pardon but none appeared as the crowd pressed on his guards spitting throwing earth cursing him sejanus endeavoured to cover his ghastly face with the fold of his purple bordered mantle a rude hand tore it away another smote him in the face his ears were deafened with cries imprecations jeers at his recent elation reproaches for the violence the judicial murders he had wrought as he came out above the temple of castor and pollux he could see the crowds engaged in tearing down his statues and pounding them to pieces then he was led across the forum past the umbilicus the supposed centre of the world and the iron door of the prison closed on him hard by a few paces off stood the temple of concord with the splendid arcade of the capitoline tabularium rising high above it hither a few hours later the trembling senators came called together by the consul regulus to decree the death of the shivering man now lying in the cold bath of hercules a stone's throw distant not an arm had been lifted not a voice raised in defence of the fallen minister even the praetorians on whose fidelity to his person he had reckoned remained motionless the people had declared with one voice against him the senate hurriedly passed the necessary forms and sejanus was condemned to death a few minutes later the door of the tulianum was opened and down the gemonian steps was cast the corpse of the man who a few hours before had been the most dreaded and respected in rome hooks were driven into the still warm flesh and it was dragged about the city given up to insult by the people and not till the third day after the execution was the mangled and disfigured mass cast into the tiber end of section sixty nine this recording is in the public domain section seventy of greece and rome read for librivox dot org by sarah hale in the time of nero by e forty painting 
page 430. The illustration represents a Roman lady of rank and position about to enter her boat. Slaves follow her, one with an umbrella to shield her from the sun. Before her steps, children scatter flowers as she walks upon the costly rugs to the magnificently decorated boat which awaits her. For all this extravagance of luxury, Nero himself set the example. He built himself a superb palace, which covered the whole Palatine Hill. In the burning of Rome, this was destroyed, and then he began another, far more costly than the old one. It covered not only the Palatine Hill, but also the greater part of the Exquiline and the valley between them. This was called the Golden House. Suetonius says that many parts of this house were entirely overlaid with gold and adorned with jewels and mother of pearl. The supper rooms were vaulted and compartments of the ceilings inlaid with ivory were made to revolve and scatter flowers. Moreover, they were provided with pipes, which shed perfumes upon the guests. The chief banqueting room was circular and revolved perpetually night and day in imitation of the motion of the celestial bodies. The baths were supplied from the sea and from albula, Upon the dedication of this magnificent house, when finished, all that Nero said was, Well, now at last, I am housed as a man should be. There was but one excuse for the extreme luxury of the times, and that was the few ways of spending money. Charity had not come into fashion, Devotion to the state was past. Travel offered many hardships and few attractions. Opportunities for making safe investments were rare. A man who had a large income could buy more land, build more palaces for himself, or beautify those that he already possessed. In short, he could increase his luxuries. And this was all that the spirit of the age expected or required of him. End of section 70. This recording is in the public domain. Section 71 of Greece and Rome. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April 6090, California, United States of America. The World Story, Volume 4, Greece and Rome. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 71. The Emperor Nero on the Stage. 67 AD. By S. Baring Gould. From day to day, a more intense longing came over the emperor to exhibit his powers and that before a discriminating, highly cultured public, his performances at the Juvenalia and before the aristocracy and the mob of Rome did not suffice. What artistic perception had they? The Greeks gave the tone to art. They were the only true aesthetically gifted people on earth. He would therefore submit his performances to their criticism. The applause of the Roman people was purchased, or was given in adulation. That of the Greeks would surely be granted according to judgment, and would be independent. The Greeks, he said, were the only people who had an ear for music, and were the only good judges of him and his attainments. In preparing for the ordeal, he was affected with genuine nervousness. He labored hard to acquire perfect skill, and to give his voice full tone. He practiced with turpness from dinner till late in the night. He lay for hours on his back with a sheet of lead on his chest, and he took emtics. He abstained from bread and fruit, 
he consumed leeks and oil. On the days before he performed, he took nothing else. He practiced vigorously at dancing, and because he could not kick about his feet with the nimbleness of his master, he had the latter put to death. At length he conceived that his heavenly voice had attained incomparable richness and volume, and that his skill was complete. So he sallied forth to confound the Greeks of Naples in a great concert. A few words may here be given to Nero's personal appearance at this period. When shaved smooth, he affected to resemble Apollo, and to have a voice which would enchant the world as a second Orpheus. He was a little below middle size, without any striking deformity. His body was covered with blotches. His neck was fat and short, and indeed, he was too fleshy and stout to make a figure as Apollo, and his stomach was unduly large and protruding, whilst his legs were small and short. His fair hair he wore cut in stages and arranged in short curls, but during the Greek tour he wore it long, flowing down over his shoulders. He usually wore a light kerchief round his throat as a protection to his voice, and a loose dress ungirded. The most particular account of his vocal powers we derive from Lucian, who, though living long after, no doubt quoted from some contemporary authority. He says that nature had given Nero a voice of very ordinary compass, but that he was bent on straining to reach high notes and growl out bass tones beyond his proper range. When he sang bass, the sound was muffled and like a buzzing of wasps or bees. However, this was helped out or disguised by the accompaniment and might have passed as a tolerable performance had it been given by anyone else but a sovereign. But when he would reach high notes like one of the great masters of song, then involuntarily the audience exploded in fits of laughter, however dangerous it was to do so. For he shook himself, gasped for breath, strained himself to the toe tips to help out his high notes, made contortions like a criminal bound to the wheel, and his naturally red face turned to the color of copper. Thoroughly prepared to electrify the world with his song, Nero set off for Neapolis, taking with him the augustal band of five thousand men, all handsome fellows with long locks, in gay uniform and with gold rings on their left hands, under an officer who received as his wage forty thousand sesteres, about three hundred pounds, per annum. They were divided into bands. The hummers, who buzzed approval, the patterers, who clapped their hands, and the clashers, who more riotously banged earthenware pot covers together, or perhaps kicked the earthenware jars on which the seats of a theater were raised. He was attended by a thousand baggage carts, the mules all shod with silver, and the drivers dressed in scarlet jackets of finest Canusian cloth. A body of Africans with glittering bracelets mounted on their genets in splendid trappings also attended him. Over the theatrical wardrobe was installed Calvia Crispinella, a noble Roman lady. As for Nero, he never wore the same garment a second time. On reaching Naples, some Alexandrians presented themselves before him. They were the inventors of a musical applause, something like the long-drawn-out amens in fashion in churches nowadays. This so delighted Nero that the men were engaged on the spot and commissioned to drill the Augustals in this new department of applause. Neapolis was crowded, all the great men and small from the neighborhood, with wives and children, had poured into the place to see and hear their emperor sing and act on the boards. It was a new form of sensation altogether. His reception was enthusiastic. He sang for whole days in succession, and hardly allowed himself time for rest. The fever of excitement and desire not to deny the audience any of what they had come to hear drove him onto the stage from his bed or from table. He did not even allow himself the time to take a bath. He had his meals served him in the orchestra, and dined and supped before the spectators, apologizing to them in Greek for the pause, saying he would only drink another drop, and then treat them to something really of the first quality. Whilst he was performing, an earthquake shook the theater, but Nero sang through it all, undisturbed thus evoking deafening cheers. Finally, it appeared as though the gods approved of this amateur dramatic prince, for after the theater was cleared of performers and spectators, shaken by the earthquake, it collapsed without injury to anyone. Nero regarded this as a good omen, and inspired by the muse of poetry, he composed and sang a hymn to the gods, thanking them for the success of this first performance. Intoxicated with applause, Nero now resolved to visit Greece itself, 
and make that classic land the judge of his execution and to strive there with the most famous artists for the crowns given in the world famous contests when it was announced that he was actually about to visit greece all the states hastened to proclaim that the contests which were recurrent in successive years at olympia nemea delphi corinth should be crowded into the space of time during which the emperor resided on greek soil so that he might achieve the distinction of being a peridonicus or victor in the whole circle he started attended by courtiers and court followers of all descriptions and with the cunning of a madman he invited as a favor to attend his triumphal progress all such members of the nobility and senate whom he had marked for death that he might destroy them at his leisure and with more security at a distance from the city he left behind him in rome a freedman helios without definite instructions but empowered to act as regent that was a wonderful expedition dio says he started for greece not as had his predecessors flaminius mummius agrippa and augustus but as a chariot driver a leer twanger a herald a dramatic performer in tragedies his army that he led consisted not of the augustians only but of so many that as far as numbers went he might have been marching against the parthians but these heroes under nero's banner in place of the weapons of war brandished fiddles and fiddlesticks masks and buskins and the victories won were worthy of the host those subdued were not a philip a perseus an anicius but a tripnus a diordus a parmines a dancing master a fiddler and a mime parmines had enjoyed some fame in the time of caius now the old fellow was dragged on to the stage to give nero the opportunity of triumphing over him and a victor of upsetting his statues if this had been all he would have been laughed at for his pains but it was intolerably humiliating for romans to hear of let alone see the reigning emperor enter the lists against other candidates practice his voice go through rehearsals march on to the stage with shaven chin and curly locks and naked with mantle cast back attended by one or two companions only and to see him glower at his rivals attack them contumely bribe the judges and officers keeping order not to turn him out and to show him some favor and all this to win the prize for lear playing when he was pitching away his credit as emperor could a disgrace be greater sulla degraded others nero degraded himself could a victory be more contemptible than one which was crowned with a few olive twigs laurels ivy or fir when he sacrificed for such the civic crown how miserable must have been his appearance when he strutted forward on high buskins and sank his imperial dignity in the dust or when he put on his mask and cast off his sovereignty what more contemptible than the parts which he picked out for himself when he was led about as a blind man simulated a madman acted the part of a woman in travail or of a vagabond he spoke moved endured all like a common strolling player with one exception that he wore when taking the role of a captive golden fetters for he said it did not become a roman prince to wear such as were of iron one day in the olympian games while chariot racing he was pitched out and almost run over nevertheless he was crowned as victor in thanks for which he made a present to the judges of two hundred thousand denarii to the plythian prophetess he gave a hundred thousand because she pronounced an oracle that gratified him but with apollo he was so irate because his oracle was unfavorable that he killed a number of men and flung their carcasses into the cleft out of which the sacred vapor arose in all of those places where there were contests he strove for the prize employing the consular cluvius rufus as his herald who trumpeted forth the announcement the caesar nero has conquered in this contest also and crowns the roman people and the universe he accepted sparta and athens from his visits the laws of lycurgus were not to his taste and therefore he did not go to lacedaemon and he was afraid lest the wrath of the avenging athene should light on him for the murder of his mother if he entered the city sacred to her moreover he shrank from an initiation into the Eleusian mysteries from a sense of his unworthiness or rather from fear of the consequences the first greek island on which nero landed was corsira and there he initiated his tour of performances by a song sung before the altar of jupiter cassius at olympia there was no theatre only a hippodrome 
Nero had adapted for his dramatic performances as well as for horse racing. Before he entered, he showed the greatest deference to the judges and assured them he had done all in his power to prepare for the ordeal. The result was in the hands of fate. He requested them as, as men of taste and culture to overlook all accidents and consider the general perfection of the performance. But though they encouraged him, he was afflicted with nervousness or suspicion and thought that any reserve in the empires was a token of disaffection. In every particular, they, he obeyed the rules laid on dramatic performers not to spit or blow the nose, and to use his sleeve only for wiping the sweat from his brow, nor to seat himself, however weary he might be. As on one occasion in the course of a tragic declamation, he dropped his staff. He trembled with nervousness, lest through his accident he should forfeit the prize and he could only be pacified when the mime who accompanied him on the sitara swore to him no one had observed it so engrossed were all in the admiration of his voice but he was not content with even the loud voice of cluvius as his herald he competed with others as to who could bellow loudest and having gained the victory in this also he took to announcing his victories himself on reaching corinth nothing would content him but that he must be cut through the isthmus the idea of uniting the Ionian and Adriatic seas had been muted before, and had been entertained by Demetrius, by Caesar, and by Caius. Nero undertook the task, not from any consideration of utility, but to show that he could do what others had failed to accomplish. He thought, says Lucian, on that old Achaean king, who on his expedition against Troy passed through the canal he had dug between Callius, Calchus, and Olus, and had cut Botia from Euboea on Darius, who had cast a bridge over the Thracian Bosphorus in his expedition against the Scythians, and even more on the undertaking of Xerxes, in its magnitude never equaled. Besides, all this he conceived that he would be giving no grander boon to all Greece than by removing the small impediment which interfered with the traffic between Greece and Italy. For, however intoxicated and disorderly the capricious power of tyrants may make them, there are moments when it does occur to them to do something great by which they may become famous. The day on which the first sod was turned was appointed to be a great festival. The emperor left Corinth, where he was then residing, at the head of a great train. On the morning he issued in gorgeous apparel from his tent. First he snatched up the lyre and sang a hymn in honor of Ephitrite and Neptune, and threw in as well an ode on Locothea and Melicertes. Then the prefect of Greece handed him a golden spade. Amidst shouts and the strains of music, he turned three cloths, collected the earth in a basket, put it on his shoulder, and after having made a magniloquent address to the laborers, returned in triumph to Corinth, as pleased with himself as if he had performed the twelve labors of Hercules. The work was begun energetically. Innumerable laborers had been collected on the spot. Vespian had sent him six thousand sturdy young Jews for the purpose, and the jails of the empire had been emptied to furnish him with a sufficiency of workmen. However, after five days of work, Nero's interest cooled, was turned in another direction, and the undertaking was abandoned. Those about his person hastened to find excuses. Bad omens were easily manufactured to cover the retreat of the emperor from a task begun with such a flourish and so speedily given up. A year and a half were spent by Nero in Greece. The expenditure was enormous, and to supply his private treasury, he had recourse to plundering temples of their stores of precious metals, and what was worse, to the execution of wealthy men, that he might possess himself of their fortunes. His progress through Greece, says Dio, was like that of a conqueror over a subjugated land. He plundered it to exhaustion, and had men, women, and children murdered. At first he required the children and freedmen of those whom he sentenced to death to give him half what his victims had left, and those condemned were allowed to make wills so as to let it appear that they were not put to death for the sake of their fortunes. But presently he took to himself either all or, or the major part, and finally he swept the whole into his pocket, and by decree banished all the children of his victims from the country. But even this did not content him and he had many of them assassinated in their exile. It would not be possible to form an estimate of the sums he took from those whom he allowed to live, and drew from the Roman temples. 
messengers were flying in all directions with no other commissions than sentences of death indeed no letters passed among people then the post being entirely occupied by the imperial correspondents to make the situation more grimly ludicrous in emulation of flamnius nero had proclaimed the freedom of greece End of section 71. This recording is in the public domain. Section 72 of Greece and Rome. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen. The World Story, Volume 4. Greece and Rome. Edited by Ava March Tappan. Section 72. The Destruction of Pompeii, 79 A.D. By Sir Edward bulwer Lytton. The sudden catastrophe, the eruption of Mount Vesuvius, which had, as it were, riven the very bonds of society, and left prisoner and jailer alike free, had soon rid Calanus of the guards to whose care the praetor had consigned him. And when the darkness and the crowd separated the priest from his attendants, he hastened with trembling steps towards the temple of his goddess. As he crept along, and ere the darkness was complete, he found himself suddenly caught by the robe, and a voice muttered in his ear, Hist, Calanus, an awful hour. Ay, by my father's head, who art thou? Thy face is dim and thy voice is strange. Not know thy Burbo? Fie! Gods, how the darkness gathers! Ho, ho! By yon terrific mountain, what sudden blazes of lightning! How they dart and quiver! Hades is loosed on earth. Tush! Thou believest not these things, Calanus. Now is the time to make our fortune. Ha! Listen! Thy temple is full of gold and precious mummeries. Let us load ourselves with them, and then hasten to the sea and embark. None will ever ask an account of the doings of this day. Burbo, thou art right. Hush, and follow me into the temple. Who cares now? Who sees now, whether thou art a priest or not? Follow, and we will share. In the precincts of the temple were many priests gathered around the altars, praying, weeping, groveling in the dust. Impostors in safety, they were not the less superstitious in danger. Calanus passed them, and entered the chamber yet to be seen in the south side of the court. Burbo followed him. The priest struck a light. Wine and viands strewed the table. The remains of a sacrificial feast. A man who has hungered forty-eight hours, muttered Calanus, has an appetite even in such a time. He seized on the food and devoured it greedily. Nothing could perhaps be more unnaturally horrid than the selfish baseness of these villains, for there is nothing more loathsome than the valor of avarice. Plunder and sacrilege while the pillars of the world tottered to and fro. What an increase to the terrors of nature can be made by the vices of man. "'Wilt thou never have done?' said Burbo, impatiently. "'Thy face purples and thine eyes start already. "'It is not every day one has such a right to be hungry. "'Oh, Jupiter, what sound is that? "'The hissing of fiery water. "'What, does the cloud give rain as well as flame? "'Ha, what? Shrieks! "'And Burbo, how silent all is now. "'Look forth.' "'Amidst the other horrors, "'the mighty mountain now cast up columns of boiling water.' Blent and kneaded with the half-burning ashes, the streams fell like seething mud over the streets in frequent intervals. And full, where the priests of Isis had now cowered around the altars, on which they had vainly sought to kindle fires and pour incense, one of the fiercest of those deadly torrents, mingled with immense fragments of scoria, had poured its rage. Over the bended forms of the priests it dashed. That cry had been of death. That silence had been of eternity. The ashes— the pitchy stream, sprinkled the altars, covered the pavement, and half concealed the quivering corpses of the priests. "'They are dead,' said Burbo, terrified for the first time, and hurrying back into the cell. "'I thought not the danger was so near and fatal.' The two wretches stood staring at each other. You might have heard their hearts beat. Calanus, the less bold by nature, but the most griping, recovered first. "'We must do our task in a way,' he said in a low whisper, "'frightened at his own voice. "'He stepped to the threshold, paused, "'crossed over the heated floor and his dead brethren "'to the sacred chapel, and called to Burbo to follow. "'But the gladiator quaked and drew back. 
"'So much the better,' thought Calanus. "'The more will be my booty.' Hastily he loaded himself with the more portable treasures of the temple, and thinking no more of his comrade, hurried from the sacred place. A sudden flash of lightning from the mount showed to Burbo, who stood motionless at the threshold, the flying and laden form of the priest. He took heart. He stepped forth to join him, when a tremendous shower of ashes fell right before his feet. The gladiator shrank back once more. Darkness closed him in. But the shower continued fast. Fast. Its heaps rose high and suffocatingly. Deathly vapors steamed from them. The wretch gasped for breath. He sought in despair again to fly. The ashes had blocked up the threshold. He shrieked as his feet shrank from the boiling fluid. How could he escape? He could not climb to the open space. Nay, were he able, he could not brave its horrors. It were best to remain in the cell, protected at least from the fatal air. He sat down and clenched his teeth. By degrees, the atmosphere from without, stifling and venomous, crept into the chamber. He could endure it no longer. His eyes, glaring round, rested on a sacrificial axe, which some priest had left in the chamber. He seized it. With the desperate strength of his gigantic arm, he attempted to hew his way through the walls. Meanwhile, the streets were already thinned. The crowd had hastened to disperse itself under shelter. The ashes began to fill up the lower parts of the town. But here and there you heard the steps of fugitives cranching them warily, or saw their pale and haggard faces by the blue glare of the lightning, or the more unsteady glare of torches, by which they endeavored to steer their steps. But ever and anon, the boiling water or the straggling ashes, mysterious and gusty winds, rising and dying in a breath, extinguish these wandering lights, and with them the last living hope of those who bore them. In the street that leads to the gate of Herculaneum, Claudius now bent his perplexed and doubtful way. If I can gain the open country, thought he, doubtless there will be various vehicles beyond the gate, and Herculaneum is not far distant. Thank Mercury I have little to lose, and that little is about me. Hello! Help there! Help! cried a querulous and frightened voice. I have fallen down. My torch has gone out. My slaves have deserted me. I am Diomed, the rich Diomed. Ten thousand sesterces to him who helps me. At the same moment, Claudius felt himself caught by the feet. Ill fortune to thee. Let me go, fool, said the gambler. Oh, help me up. Give me thy hand. There, rise. Is this Claudius? I know the voice. Whither fliest thou? Towards Herculaneum. Blessed be the gods. Our way is the same, then, as far as the gate. Why not take refuge in my villa? Thou knowest the long range of subterranean cellars beneath the basement. That shelter, what shower can penetrate? You speak well, said Claudius, musingly. And by storing the cellar with food, we can remain there even some days, should these wondrous storms endure so long. Oh, blessed be he who invented gates to a city, cried Diomed. See, they have placed a light within yon arch. By that let us guide our steps." The air was now still for a few minutes. The lamp from the gate streamed out far and near. The fugitives hurried on. They gained the gate. They passed by the Roman sentry. The lightning flashed over his livid face and polished helmet, but his stern features were composed even in their awe. He remained erect and motionless at his post. That hour itself had not animated the machine of the ruthless majesty of Rome into the reasoning and self-acting man. There he stood, amidst the crashing elements. He had not received the permission to desert his station and escape. The cloud which had scattered so deep a murkiness over the day had now settled into a solid and impenetrable mass. It resembled less even the thickest gloom of a night in the open air than the close and blind darkness of some narrow room. But in proportion as the blackness gathered did the lightnings around Vesuvius increase in their vivid and scorching glare, nor was their horrible beauty confined to the usual hues of fire. No rainbow ever rivaled their varying and prodigal dyes, now brightly blue as the most azure depth of a southern sky, now of a livid and snake-like green, darting restlessly to and fro as the folds of an enormous serpent, now of a lurid and intolerable crimson, gushing forth through the columns of smoke far and wide, and lighting up the whole city from arch to arch then suddenly dying into a sickly paleness, like the ghost of their own life. In the pauses of the showers you heard the rumbling of the earth beneath, and the groaning waves of the tortured sea, 
or lower still, and audible but to the watch of intensest fear, the grinding and hissing murmur of the escaping gases through the chasms of the distant mountain. Sometimes the cloud appeared to break from its solid mass, and by the lightning to assume quaint and vast mimicries of human or of monster shapes, striding across the gloom, hurtling one upon the other, and vanishing swiftly into the turbulent abyss of shade, so that, to the eyes and fancies of the affrighted wanderers, the unsubstantial vapors were as the bodily forms of gigantic foes, the agents of terror and of death. The ashes in many places were already knee-deep, and the boiling showers which came from the steaming breath of the volcano forced their way into the houses, bearing with them a strong and suffocating vapor. In some places, immense fragments of rock, hurled upon the house roofs, bore down along the streets masses of confused ruin, which yet more and more with every hour obstructed the way. And as the day advanced, the motion of the earth was more sensibly felt. The footing seemed to slide and creep, nor could chariot or litter be kept steady, even on the most level ground. Sometimes the huger stones, striking against each other as they fell, broke into countless fragments, emitting sparks of fire, which caught whatever was combustible within their reach. And along the plains beyond the city, the darkness was now terribly relieved, for several houses and even vineyards had been set on flames, and at various intervals the fires rose sullenly and fiercely against the solid gloom. To add to this partial relief of the darkness, the citizens had here and there, in the more public places, such as the porticos of temples and the entrances to the forum, endeavored to place rows of torches, but these rarely continued long. The showers and the winds extinguished them, and the sudden darkness into which their fitful light was converted had something in it doubly terrible and doubly impressive on the impotence of human hopes, the lesson of despair. Frequently, by the momentary light of these torches, parties of fugitives encountered each other, some hurrying towards the sea, others flying from the sea back to the land, for the ocean had retreated rapidly from the shore. An utter darkness lay over it, and upon its groaning and tossing waves the storm of cinders and rocks fell without the protection which the streets and roofs afforded to the land. Wild, haggard, ghastly with supernatural fears, these groups encountered each other, but without the leisure to speak, to consult, to advise, for the showers fell now frequently, though not continuously, extinguishing the lights, which showed to each band the death-like faces of the other, and hurrying all to seek refuge beneath the nearest shelter. The whole elements of civilization were broken up. Ever and anon by the flickering lights, you saw the thief hastening by the most solemn authorities of the law, laden with, and fearfully chuckling over, the produce of his sudden gains. If, in the darkness, wife was separated from husband, or parent from child, vain was the hope of reunion." each hurried blindly and confusedly on. Nothing in all the various and complicated machinery of social life was left, save the primal law of self-preservation. Through this awful scene did the Athenian wade his way, accompanied by Ione and the blind girl. Suddenly a rush of hundreds in their path to the sea swept by them. Nydia was torn from the side of Glaucus, who, with Ione, was borne rapidly onward, and when the crowd— whose forms they saw not, so thick was the gloom, were gone, Nydia was still separated from their side. Glaucus shouted her name. No answer came. They retraced their steps. In vain. They could not discover her. It was evident she had been swept along in some opposite direction by the human current. Their friend, their preserver, was lost. And hitherto, Nydia had been their guide. Her blindness rendered the scene familiar to her alone. Accustomed, through a perpetual night, to thread the windings of the city, she had led them unerringly towards the seashore, by which they had resolved to hazard an escape. Now which way could they wend? All was rayless to them, a maze without a clue. Wearied, despondent, bewildered, they, however, passed along, the ashes falling upon their heads, the fragmentary stones dashing up in sparkles before their feet. Alas! Alas! murmured Ione. I can go no farther. My steps sink among the scorching cinders. Fly, dearest. Beloved, fly, and leave me to my fate. Hush, my betrothed, my bride. Death with thee is sweeter than life without thee. Yet whither, oh, whither can we direct ourselves through the gloom? 
Already it seems that we have made but a circle, and are in the very spot which we quitted an hour ago. Oh, gods! Yon rock! See, it hath riven the roof before us. It is death to move through the streets. Blessed lightning! See, Ione, see! The portico of the Temple of Fortune is before us. Let us creep beneath it. It will protect us from the showers. He caught his beloved in his arms, and with difficulty and labor gained the temple. He bore her to the remoter and more sheltered part of the portico, and leaned over her that he might shield her with his own form from the lightning and the showers. The beauty and the unselfishness of love could hallow even that dismal time. "'Who is there?' said the trembling and hollow voice of one who had preceded them in their place of refuge. "'Yet what matters? The crush of the ruined world forbids to us friends or foes.' Ione turned again at the sound of the voice, and with a faint shriek cowered again beneath the arms of Glaucus, and he, looking in the direction of the voice, beheld the cause of her alarm. Through the darkness glared forth two burning eyes. The lightning flashed and lingered athwart the temple, and Glaucus, with a shudder, perceived the lion to which he had been doomed, couched beneath the pillars, and close beside it, unwitting of the vicinity, lay the giant form of him who had accosted them, the wounded gladiator, Niger. That lightning had revealed to each other the form of beast and man, yet the instinct of both was quelled. Nay, the lion crept nearer and nearer to the gladiator, as for companionship, and the gladiator did not recede or tremble. The revolution of nature had dissolved her lighter terrors, as well as her wanted ties. While they were thus terribly protected, a group of men and women, bearing torches, passed by the temple. They were of the congregation of the Nazarenes, and a sublime and unearthly emotion had not, indeed, quelled their awe, but it had robbed awe of fear. They had long believed, according to the error of the early Christians, that the last day was at hand. They imagined now that the day had come. "'Woe! Woe!' cried in a shrill and piercing voice the elder at their head. "'Behold! The Lord descendeth to judgment!' He maketh fire come down from heaven in the sight of men. End of section 72。section 73 of Greece and Rome。this is a LibriVox recording。all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org。recording by Avai。in October 2018. The World's Story, Volume 4, Greece and Rome, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 73. A Visit to Pompeii, 19th Century, by Charles Dickens. Stand at the bottom of the great marketplace of Pompeii, and look up the silent streets, through the ruined temples of Jupiter and Isis, over the broken houses with their inmost sanctuaries open to the day, away to Mount Vesuvius, bright and snowy in the peaceful distance, and lose all count of time and heed of other things, in the strange and melancholy sensation of seeing the destroyed and destroyer making this quiet picture in the sun. Then ramble on, and see, at every turn, the little familiar tokens of human habitation and everyday pursuits, the chafing of the bucket rope in the stone rim of the exhausted well, the track of carriage wheels in the pavement of the street, the marks of drinking vessels on the stone counter of the wine shop, the amphorae in private cellars, stored away so many hundred years ago, and undisturbed to this hour, all rendering the solitude and deadly loneliness of the place ten thousand times more solemn than if the volcano in its fury had swept the city from the earth and sunk it in the bottom of the sea. After it was shaken by the earthquake, which preceded the eruption, workmen were employed in shaping out, in stone, new ornaments for temples and other buildings that had suffered. Here lies their work, outside the city gate, as if they would return to-morrow. Next to the wonder of going up and down the streets, and in and out of the houses, 
and traversing the secret chambers of the temples of a religion that has vanished from the earth and finding so many traces of remote antiquity as if the course of time had been stopped after this desolation and there had been no nights and days months years and centuries since nothing is more impressive and terrible than the many evidences of the searching nature of the ashes as bespeaking their irresistible power and the impossibility of escaping them in the wine cellars they forced their way into the earthen vessels displacing the wine and choking them to the brim with dust in the tombs they forced the ashes of the dead from the funeral urns and drained new ruin even into them the mouths and eyes and skulls of all the skeletons were stuffed with this terrible hail in herculaneum where the flood was of a different and heavier kind it rolled in like a sea imagine a deluge of water turned into marble at its height and that is what is called the lava here many of the paintings on the walls in the roofless chambers of both cities or carefully removed to the museum at naples are as fresh and plain as if they had been executed yesterday here are the subjects of still life as provisions dead game bottles glasses and the like familiar classical stories or mythological fables always forcibly and plainly told conceits of cupids quarrelling sporting working at trades theatrical rehearsals poets reading their productions to their friends inscriptions chalked upon the walls political squibs advertisements rough drawings by schoolboys everything to people and restore the ancient cities in the fancy of the wandering visitor furniture too you see of every kind lamps tables couches vessels for eating drinking and cooking workmen's tools surgical instruments tickets for the theatre pieces of money personal ornaments bunches of keys found clenched in the grasps of skeletons helmets of guards and warriors little household bells yet musical with their old domestic tones the least among these objects lends its aid to swell the interest of vesuvius and invest it with a perfect fascination then looking from either ruined city into the neighbouring grounds overgrown with beautiful vines and luxuriant trees and remembering that house upon house temple on temple building after building and street after street are still lying underneath the roots of all the quiet cultivation waiting to be turned up to the light of day is something so wonderful so full of mystery so captivating to the imagination that one would think it would be paramount and yield to nothing else to nothing but vesuvius but the mountain is the genius of the scene from every indication of the ruin it has worked we look again with an absorbing interest to where its smoke is rising up into the sky it is beyond us as we thread the ruined streets above us as we stand upon the ruined walls we follow it through every vista of broken columns as we wander through the empty courtyards of the houses and through the garlandings and interlacings of every wandering vine end of section 73「Section 74 of Greece and Rome. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devora Allen. The World Story, Volume 4, Greece and Rome. Edited by Ava March Tappan. Section 74. How to Treat the Christians. 112 A.D. A Letter of Pliny the Younger to the Emperor Trajan and Trajan's reply. Pliny was governor of Bithynia in 112 A.D. The Christians had become numerous, and he wrote to the emperor about them, and asked his advice in regard to their treatment. This is given in the emperor's reply, which follows Pliny's letter. 
the Roman persecutions of the Christians arose chiefly from the fact that, while other sects and nationalities were ready to accept the gods of the Romans as well as their own, the Christians declared that there was but one God. They bore terrible tortures and the most agonizing forms of death, rather than in worship cast a handful of incense before the statue of some Roman deity or of a deified emperor. Such scorn of the gods would arouse their wrath, thought the Romans, and would bring down upon the state some awful disaster. This is why the severest persecutions often took place during the reigns of those emperors who were most anxious to do well by their people. The Editor It is my custom, sire, to refer to you in all cases where I do not feel sure, for who can better direct my doubts or inform my ignorance? I have never been present at any legal examination of the Christians, and I do not know, therefore, what are the usual penalties passed upon them, or the limits of those penalties, or how searching an inquiry should be made. I have hesitated a great deal in considering whether any distinctions should be drawn according to the ages of the accused, whether the weak should be punished as severely as the more robust, whether if they renounce their faith they should be pardoned, or whether the man who has once been a Christian should gain nothing by recanting, whether the name itself, even though otherwise innocent of crime, should be punished, or only the crimes that gather round it. In the meantime, this is the plan which I have adopted in the case of those Christians who have been brought before me. I ask them whether they are Christians. If they say yes, then I repeat the question a second and a third time, warning them of the penalties it entails, and if they still persist, I order them to be taken to prison. For I do not doubt that, whatever the character of the crime may be which they confess, their pertinacity and inflexible obstinacy certainly ought to be punished." There were others who showed similar mad folly, whom I reserved to be sent to Rome, as they were Roman citizens. Subsequently, as is usually the way, the very fact of my taking up this question led to a great increase of accusations, and a variety of cases were brought before me. A pamphlet was issued anonymously, containing the names of a number of people. Those who denied that they were or had been Christians, and called upon the gods in the usual formula, reciting the words after me, those who offered incense and wine before your image, which I had given orders to be brought forward for this purpose, together with the statues of the deities. All such I considered should be discharged, especially as they curse the name of Christ, which, it is said, those who are really Christians cannot be induced to do. Others, whose names were given me by an informer, first said that they were Christians, and afterwards denied it, declaring that they had been, but were so no longer, some of them having recanted many years before and more than one so long as twenty years back. They all worshipped your image and the statues of the deities, and cursed the name of Christ. But they declared that the sum of their guilt, or their error, only amounted to this, that on a stated day they had been accustomed to meet before daybreak, and to recite a hymn among themselves to Christ, as though he were a god, and that so far from binding themselves by oath to commit any crime, their oath was to abstain from theft, robbery, adultery, and from breach of faith, and not to deny trust money placed in their keeping when called upon to deliver it. When this ceremony was concluded, it had been their custom to depart and meet again to take food, but it was of no special character, and quite harmless, and they had ceased this practice after the edict in which, in accordance with your orders, I had forbidden all secret societies. I thought it the more necessary, therefore, to find out what truth there was in these statements by submitting two women, who were called deaconesses, to the torture." but I found nothing but a debased superstition carried to great lengths. So I postponed my examination and immediately consulted you. The matter seems to me worthy of your consideration, especially as there are so many people involved in the danger. Many persons of all ages, and of both sexes alike, are being brought into peril of their lives by their accusers, and the process will go on. For the contagion of this superstition has spread not only through the free cities, but into the villages and the rural districts, and yet it seems to me that it can be checked and set right. It is beyond doubt that the temples, which have been almost deserted, are beginning again to be thronged with worshippers, that the sacred rites which have for a long time been allowed to lapse are now being renewed, and that the food for the sacrificial victims is once more finding a sale, whereas, up to recently, a buyer was hardly to be found. From this it is easy to infer what vast numbers of people might be reclaimed if only they were given an opportunity of repentance. THE REPLY OF THE EMPEROR You have adopted the proper course, my dear Pliny, in examining into the cases of those who have been denounced to you as Christians, 
for no hard and fast rule can be laid down to meet a question of such wide extent. The Christians are not to be hunted out. If they are brought before you and the offense is proved, they are to be punished. But with this reservation, that if anyone denies that he is a Christian and makes it clear that he is not by offering prayers to our deities, then he is to be pardoned because of his recantation, however suspicious his past conduct may have been. But pamphlets published anonymously must not carry any weight whatever, no matter what the charge may be. For they are not only a precedent of the very worst type, but they are not in consonance with the spirit of our age. End of section 74、section、75、of Greece and Rome Read for LibriVox.org Rome, Part 7 How the Romans Amused Themselves Historical Note The amusements of the Romans were theatrical entertainments. The games of the circus, and far more interesting to them than these, the gladiatorial exhibitions. At first, captives or criminals condemned to death were made to fight one another in the arena for the delight of the spectators. Then, regular schools were established, and not only slaves, spurred on by the hope of freedom, but desperadoes of all ranks flocked thither to learn how to meet either men or wild beasts in life and death conflict. The people were mad for these brutal shows. And no one could hope for political preferment who did not amuse them by such entertainments. The shows became more and more expensive as the eagerness for bloody spectacles increased. Sometimes the vast expanse of the amphitheater was flooded with water, and warships filled with gladiators engaged in desperate battles. Occasionally, whole forests of trees were set up in it, and thousands of rare animals turned loose to be hunted down. Bears, wolves, tigers, leopards, lions, even crocodiles, were brought to Rome at enormous expense from the ends of the earth. The people demanded more and more, and at length matters reached such a point that an emperor who wished to be popular sometimes provided many thousands of both men and beasts for the arena. As Christianity increased in power, every effort was made to suppress these awful scenes, and at length, in 404 A.D., they were abolished. By imperial edict. End of section seventy-five. This recording is in the public domain. Section seventy-six of Greece and Rome, read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone. Police verso. Thumbs down. By Jean Leon Jerome, French painter, eighteen twenty-four to nineteen o four. Painting, page four hundred and sixty. The luxury and the cruelty of imperial Rome culminated in the amphitheatre, where gladiators fought to the death or matched their strength and skill against wild beasts. Every city throughout the empire had its own amphitheatre, greater or smaller according to its wealth, but the most famous of all was the mighty Colosseum at Rome, built by the Emperor Vespasian and his son Titus, a monument surpassed in magnitude by the pyramids alone. This vast structure covered five acres, and when filled with a Roman audience. Must have presented a scene of unsurpassed magnificence. Below is the yellow sand of the arena, sprinkled by the more extravagant emperors with powdered minerals of brilliant colours, blue, green, or red, and spotted here and there, perhaps, with dark pools of blood. Above the arena rises a high wall. Covered during the shows of wild beasts with nets of golden cord knotted with amber for the protection of the spectators. Next is the emperor, seated on a magnificent throne, surrounded by courtiers and members of his household, senators and patricians in gorgeous robes, and the vestal virgins clad in snowy white. Beyond are the common citizens. More than eighty thousand, rising tier upon tier, while above it all stretches the many-coloured awnings that protect the spectators from the sun. 
in the famous Polici verso the victorious gladiator stands in the arena with sword in hand and foot on the breast of his vanquished opponent the royal party sitting between the columns surmounted with eagles have little interest in the affair but the populace are watching eagerly to learn the wishes of the vestal virgins the victim by his upraised hand pleads for mercy but the white-robed virgins who guard the sacred flame of vesta goddess of hearth and home refuse the boon and with downturned thumbs police verso demand his death end of section seventy six this recording is in the public domain Section 77 of Greece and Rome Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter The Dying Gladiator by Lord Byron The poem describes the famous statue known as the Dying Gladiator, or the Dying Gaul. The Editor I see before me the gladiator lie. He leans upon his hand. His manly brow consents to death, but conquers agony and his drooped head sinks gradually low. And through his side the last drops, ebbing slow from the red gash, fall heavy, one by one, like the first of a thunder shower. And now the arena swims around him. He is gone, ere ceased the inhuman shout which hailed the wretch who won. He heard it, but he heeded not, his eyes were with his heart, and that was far away. He recked not of the life he lost, nor prize, but where his rude hut by the Danube lay, there were his young barbarians all at play, there was their Dacian mother, he, their sire, butchered to make a Roman holiday. All this rushed with his blood. Shall he expire? And unavenged, arise, ye Goths, and glut your ire. End of section 77. This recording is in the public domain. Section 78 of Greece and Rome. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Story, Volume 4 Greece and Rome Edited by Eva March Tappan Section 78 The Christian Martyrs in the Arena 64 A.D. From Quo Vadis By Henrik Sienkiewicz During the reign of Nero occurred the terrible fire which destroyed more than half of the Roman capital. There were rumors abroad that Nero himself had set fire to the city in order that its burning might afford him a new amusement. These rumors became so threatening that the emperor thought it the part of wisdom to avert suspicion from himself by charging the crime upon the Christians. In the savage persecution which followed, St. Paul was beheaded. The Editor Meanwhile the trumpets announced the end of the interval. People began to leave the passages where they had assembled to straighten their legs and converse. A general movement set in with the usual dispute about seats occupied previously. Senators and patricians hastened to their places, the uproar ceased after a time, and the amphitheater returned to order. On the arena, a crowd of people appeared to dig out here and there lumps of sand, formed with stiffened blood. The turn of the Christians was at hand. But since that was a new spectacle for people, and no one knew how they would bear themselves, all waited with a certain curiosity. 
the disposition of the audience was attentive but unfriendly. They were waiting for uncommon scenes. Those people who were to appear had burned Rome and its ancient treasures. They had drunk the blood of infants and poisoned water. They had cursed the whole human race and committed the vilest crimes. The harshest punishment did not suffice the roused hatred, and if any fear possessed people's hearts, it was this, that the torture of the Christians would not equal the guilt of those ominous criminals. Meanwhile the sun had risen high, its rays passing through the purple velarium had filled the amphitheater with a bloody light. The sand assumed a fiery color, and in those gleams, in the faces of people, as well as in the empty arena, which after a time was to be filled with the torture of people and the rage of savage beasts, there was something terrible. Death and terror seemed hovering in the air. The throng, usually gladsome, became moody under the influence of hate and silence. Faces had a sullen expression. Now the prefect gave a sign. The same old man appeared, dressed as Charon, who had called the gladiators to death, and passing with slow step across the arena amid silence, he struck three times again on the door. Throughout the amphitheater was heard the deep murmur, Christians, the Christians. The iron gratings creaked. Through the dark openings were heard the usual cries of the scourgers. To the sand! And in one moment the arena was peopled with crowds, as it were of satyrs covered with skins. All ran quickly, somewhat feverishly, and reaching the middle of the circle, they knelt one by another with raised hands. The spectators, judging this to be a prayer for pity, and enraged by such cowardice, began to stamp, whistle, throw empty wine vessels, bones from which the flesh had been eaten, and shout, The beasts! The beasts! But all at once something unexpected took place. From out the shaggy assembly singing voices were raised, and then sounded that hymn heard for the first time in a Roman amphitheater, Christus Regnat. Astonishment seized the spectators. The condemned sang with eyes raised to the valerium. The audience saw faces pale, as it were, inspired, all understood that those people were not asking for mercy, that they seemed not to see the circus, the audience, the senate, or Caesar. Christus Regnot rose ever louder, and in the seats far up to the highest, among the rows of spectators, more than one asked himself the question, What is happening? And who is that Christus who reigns in the mouths of those people who are about to die? But meanwhile, a new grating was opened, and into the arena rushed with mad speed and barking whole packs of dogs. Gigantic, yellow Malajans from the Peloponnesus, pied dogs from the Pyrenees, and wolf-like hounds from Hibernia, Purposely famished, their sides were lank and their eyes bloodshot. Their howls and whines filled the amphitheater. When the Christians had finished their hymn, they remained kneeling, motionless, as if petrified, merely repeating in one groaning chorus, Pro Christo, Pro Christo. The dogs catching the odor of people under the skins of beasts, and surprised by their silence, did not rush on them at once. Some stood against the walls of the boxes, as if wishing to go among the spectators, 
Others ran around, barking furiously, as though chasing some unseen beast. The people were angry. A thousand voices began to call. Some howled like wild beasts, some barked like dogs. Others urged them on in every language. The amphitheater was trembling from uproar. The excited dogs began to run to the kneeling people, then to draw back, snapping their teeth, till at last one of the Malajans drove his teeth into the shoulder of a woman kneeling in front and dragged her under him. Tens of the dogs rushed into the crowd now, as if to break through it. The audience ceased to howl so as to look with greater attention. Amidst the howling and the whining were heard yet the plaintive voices of men and women. Pro Cristo! Pro Cristo! But on the arena were formed quivering masses of the bodies of dogs and people. Blood flowed in streams from the torn bodies. Dogs dragged from each other the bloody limbs of people. The odor of blood and torn entrails was stronger than Arabian perfumes, and filled the whole circus. At last only here and there were visible, single kneeling forms, which were soon covered by moving, squirming masses. Vinicius, who at that moment, when the Christians ran in, stood up and turned as to indicate to the quarrymen, as he had promised, the direction in which the apostle was hidden among the people of Petronius, sat down again, and with the face of a dead man continued to look with glassy eyes on the ghastly spectacle. At first fear that the quarrymen might have been mistaken, and that perchance Lygia was among the victims, benumbed him completely. But when he heard the voices, Pro Cristo! When he saw the torture of so many victims, who in dying confessed their faith and their God, another feeling possessed him, piercing him like the most dreadful pain, but irresistible. That feeling was this. If Christ himself died in torment, if thousands are perishing for him now, if a sea of blood is poured forth, one drop more signifies nothing, and it is a sin even to ask for mercy. That thought came to him from the arena, penetrated him with the groans of the dying, with the odor of their blood. But still he prayed and repeated with parched lips, O oh Christ, O oh Christ, and thy apostle prayed for her. Then he forgot himself, lost consciousness of where he was. It seemed to him that blood on the arena was rising and rising, that it was coming up and flowing out of the circus over all Rome. For the rest he heard nothing, neither the howling of dogs nor the uproar of the people, nor the voices of the Augustians, who began all at once to cry, Kilo has fainted! Kilo has fainted, said Petronius, turning toward the Greek. And he had fainted, really. He sat there white as linen, his head fallen back, his mouth wide open, like that of a corpse. At that same moment, they were urging into the arena new victims, sewed up in skins. These knelt immediately, like those who had gone before but the weary dogs would not rend them. Barely a few threw themselves onto those kneeling nearest, but others lay down, and raising their bloody jaws began to scratch their sides and yawn heavily. Then the audience, disturbed in spirit but drunk with blood and wild, began to cry with hoarse voices, The lions! The lions! Let out the lions! The lions were to be kept for the next day, but in the amphitheaters the people imposed their will on everyone, even on Caesar. Caligula alone, 
insolent and changeable in his wishes, dared to oppose them. And there were cases when he gave command to beat the people with clubs, but even he yielded most frequently. Nero, to whom plaudits were dearer than all else in the world, never resisted. All the more did he not resist now, when it was a question of mollifying the populace, excited after the conflagration, and a question of the Christians, on whom he wished to cast the blame of the catastrophe. He gave the sign, therefore, to open the caniculum, seeing which the people were calmed in a moment. They heard the creaking of the doors behind which the lions were. At sight of the lions, the dogs gathered in one crowd on the opposite side of the arena with low whines. The lions walked into the arena one after another, immense, tawny, with great shaggy heads. Caesar himself turned his wearied face toward them, and placed the emerald to his eye to see better. The Augustians greeted them with applause. The crowd counted them on their fingers and followed eagerly the impression which the sight of them would make on the Christians kneeling in the center, who again had begun to repeat the words, without meaning for many, but annoying to all, Pro Cristo, Pro Cristo. But the lions, though hungry, did not hasten to their victims. The ruddy light in the arena dazzled them, so they half-closed their eyes as if dazed. Some stretched their yellowish bodies lazily. Some, opening their jaws, yawned. One might have said that they wanted to show their terrible teeth to the audience. But later the odor of blood and torn bodies many of which were lying on the sand, began to act on them. Soon their movements became restless. Their manes rose, their nostrils drew in the air with a hoarse sound. One of them fell suddenly on the body of a woman with a torn face, and lying with his forepaws on the body, licked with rough tongue the stiffened blood. Another approached a man who was holding in his arms a child sewed up in a fawn skin. The child, trembling from crying and weeping, clung convulsively to the neck of its father. He, wishing to prolong its life even for a moment, tried to pull it from his neck so as to hand it to those kneeling farther on. But the cry and the movement irritated the lion. All at once he gave out a short, broken roar, killed the child with one blow of his paw, and seizing the head of the father in his jaws, crushed it in a twinkle. At sight of this, all the other lions fell upon the crowd of Christians. Some women could not restrain cries of terror, but the audience drowned these with plaudits, which soon ceased, however, for the wish to see gained the mastery. They beheld terrible things then. Heads disappearing entirely in open jaws. Breasts torn apart with one blow. Hearts and lungs swept away. The crushing of bones under the teeth of lions. Some lions, seizing victims by the ribs or loins, ran with mad springs through the arena as if seeking hidden places in which to devour them. Others fought, rose on their hind legs, grappled one another like wrestlers, and filled the amphitheater with thunder. People rose from their places. Some left their seats, went down lower through the passages to see better, and crowded one another mortally. It seemed that the excited multitude would throw itself at last into the arena and rend the Christians in company with the lions. At moments, an unearthly noise was heard. At moments, applause. At moments, roaring, rumbling, the clashing of teeth, the howling of Malajan dogs. At times, only groans. Caesar, holding the emerald to his eye, 
looked now with attention. The face of Petronius assumed an expression of contempt and disgust. Kilo had been born out of the circus. But from the caniculum, new victims were driven out continually. From the highest row in the amphitheater, the Apostle Peter looked at them. No one saw him, for all heads were turned to the arena. So he rose, and as formerly in the vineyard of Cornelius, he had blessed for death and eternity those who were intended for imprisonment. So now he blessed with the cross those who were perishing under the teeth of wild beasts. He blessed their blood, their torture, their dead bodies turned into shapeless masses, and their souls flying away from the bloody sand. Some raised their eyes to him, and their faces grew radiant. They smiled when they saw high above them the sign of the cross. But his heart was rent, and he said, O oh Lord, let thy will be done. These my sheep perish to thy glory, in testimony of the truth. Thou didst command me to feed them. Hence I give them to thee, and do thou count them, Lord. Take them, heal their wounds, soften their pain. Give them happiness, greater than the torments they suffer here. End of Section 85 This recording is in the public domain. Recording by The Story Girl Section 79 of Greece and Rome This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Story, Volume 4, Greece and Rome, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 79, A Roman Banquet by W. A. Becker, adapted from Petronius. The dinner hour had arrived, and by the activity of his very numerous slaves, Everything was prepared in the house of Lentulus for a grand reception of guests. The fires blazed brightly in the kitchen, where the cook, assisted by a number of underlings, was exhausting all his skill. Whenever the covers were removed from the vessels, a grateful odor, more inviting than the smoke of a fat burnt offering, diffused itself around and ascended on high to the habitation of the gods the party cook and carver were occupied in arranging the dessert in all the forms that ingenuity could suggest while the first course was ready for serving the triclinium footnote a couch on which romans reclined while eating in the footnote had been placed in a spacious saloon the northerly aspect of which was well adapted for the time of year around a beautiful table covered with cedar wood stood elegant sofas inlaid with tortoise shell the lower part decked with white hangings embroidered with gold and the pillows which were stuffed with the softest wool covered with gorgeous purple upon the seats cushions covered with silken stuff were laid to separate the places of the guests the butler was still arranging the side tables on which valuable drinking vessels were displayed and in straightening the draperies of the triclinium when his lord entered accompanied by the guests lentulus had invited only six friends but pomponius anxious that the number of the muses should occupy the triclinium and no place be left empty brought with him two friends whom he introduced as gentlemen from perugia it is long methinks said gallus to his courteous host on entering since we last met in this saloon how beautifully you have in the meantime ornamented it 
you certainly could not have chosen a more appropriate picture for a triclinium than those satyrs celebrating the joyous vintage and the slain boar a scene from lusania the fruit and provision pieces over the doors and between them the elegant twigs on which the thrushes are sitting all are calculated to awaken a relish for the banquet yes really interposed pomponius lentulus understands far better than calpurnius how to decorate a dining-hall the other day he had the walls of his finest triclinium painted with the murder of hipparchus and the death of brutus and instead of agreeable foliage threatening lictors were to be seen at every corner he too is right in his way said gallus but where is he i understood that you had invited him lentulus he was unfortunately pre-engaged replied the other but we shall see him before the evening be over added pomponius as our friend fannius is you know averse to sitting late and lentulus will not i am sure let us go before the crowing of the cock we shall be one short at the triclinium unless calpurnius come according to his promise and fill the vacant place so soon as he can get released from his formal consular supper but i scarcely think we ought to keep the cook waiting any longer the tenth hour is i verily believe almost elapsed had we not better take our seats lentulus the host answered in the affirmative and conducted gallus to the lowest place on the middle sofa which was the seat of honour at the table at his left and on the same dining couch sat pomponius above him fannius the sofa to the left was occupied by bassus fontinus and sicilianus to the right and next gallus sat lentulus himself below him the perusians whom pomponius had brought as soon as they had reclined slaves took off their sandals and youths with their loins girded offered water in silver bowls for their ablutions at a nod from lentulus two slaves entered and placed upon the table the tray which contained the dishes composing the first course lentulus cast his eyes with secret joy around the circle as if desirous of noting the impression made on his friends by the novel arrangements of this course the invention of which was due to himself and indeed the service was worthy of a nearer observation in the centre of the plateau ornamented with tortoise shell stood an ass of bronze on either side of which hung silver panniers filled with white and black olives preserved by the art of the cook until this period of the year on the back of the beast sat a silenus from whose skin the most delicious sauce flowed upon the meat beneath near this on two silver gridirons lay delicately dressed sausages beneath which syrian plums mixed with the seed of the pomegranate presented the appearance of glowing coals around stood silver dishes containing asparagus lettuce radishes and other productions of the garden in addition to fish flavoured both with mint and rue and with byzantine pickle and dressed snails and oysters whilst fresh ones in abundance were handed round the company expressed their admiration of their host's fanciful invention and then proceeded to help themselves to what each according to his taste considered the best incentive of an appetite at the same time slaves carried round in golden goblets the mulsum composed of hymetian honey and falernian wines they were still occupied in tasting the several delicacies when a second and smaller tray was brought in and placed in a vacant spot within the first to which it did not yield in point of singularity in the elegant basket sat a hen ingeniously carved out of wood with outspread wings as if she were brooding straightway entered two slaves who began searching in the chaff which filled the basket and taking out some eggs distributed them among the guests friends said lentulus smiling they are peahen's eggs which have been put under the hen my only fear is that she may have sat too long upon them but let us try them a slave then gave to each guest a silver snail which was however found almost too large and heavy for the purpose and each proceeded to break an egg with the point of it most of the party were already acquainted with the jokes of lentulus but not so 
the perusians truly my egg has already become a hen cried one of them in disgust and about to throw it away examine a little more closely said pomponius with a laugh in which the guests at the upper sofa who were better acquainted with the matter joined our friend's cook understands well how to dress eggs that have been already sat upon the perusian then for the first time remarked that its shell was not natural but made of dough and that a fat fig pecker was hidden in the yolk which was strongly seasoned with pepper many jokes were made and whilst the guests were eating the mysterious eggs the slaves again presented the honey wine when no one desired more the band which was at the other end of the hall began to play as a sign for the slaves to remove the dishes which they proceeded to do another slave wiped the table with a purple cloth of coarse linen and two ethiopians again handed water for washing the hands boys wearing green garlands then brought in two well gypsumed wine jars the time corroded necks of which well accorded with the inscription on a label hanging round them whereon might be read written in ancient characters the words l apimio cos discharge your office well iranos cried lentulus to one of the boys to-day you shall bear the ladle it is falernian my friends and opiumum too and is as you know usually clouded it was bright enough said gallus when the free citizens wrote the name of the consul on this label yet it only shares the fate of the age which like it has also become clouded the perusians began to listen attentively and pomponius cautiously placed his finger on his mouth actually continued he only five years more and this noble juice would have witnessed a century pass away and during this century there has never been growth like it why maximus your great-grandfather was consul in the same year as apimius and see here is the fourth generation already and yet the wine is still in existence quite right replied maximus my ancestor was consul with apimius and much as i like the wine i am yet vexed to think that my name does not appear on the jar content yourself quoth gallus there are more serious accidents in life than that oh quickly interposed pomponius let us end this grave conversation only see how bassus and sicilianus are longing for the contents of the jars whilst we are indulging in speculations about the label outside have them opened lentulus the vessels were carefully cleansed of the gypsum and the corks extricated Eranus cautiously poured the wine into the silver cooler which was placed ready and was now filled again with fresh snow and then mixed it according to his master's directions in the richly embossed bowl and dipping a golden ladle therein filled the amethyst coloured glasses which were distributed amongst the guests by the rest of the boys this operation was scarcely finished before a new serving tray was placed upon the table containing the first course of the feast which however by no means answered the expectations of the guests a circle of small dishes covered with such meats as were to be met with only at the tables of plebeians was ranged around a slip of natural turf on which lay a honeycomb a slave carried round the bread in a silver basket and the guests were preparing though with evident vexation to help themselves to chickpeas and small fish when at a sign from lentulus two slaves hurried forward and took off the upper part of the tray under which a number of dishes presenting a rich selection of dainties were concealed there were ring-doves and field fares capons and ducks mullets of three pounds weight and turbot and in the centre a fatted hare which by means of artificial wings the chef had ingeniously changed into a pegasus the company were agreeably surprised and applauded the host with clapping of hands and the carver immediately approached and with great solemnity and almost in musical time began to carve erinos meanwhile was diligently discharging his functions and the guests animated by the strength of the falernian already began to be more merry on the disappearance of the first course much conversation was kept up gallus alone taking less share in it than he was accustomed to do but no long interval was allowed for talking four slaves soon entered to the sound of horns bearing the second course which consisted of a huge boar surrounded by eight sucking pigs made of sweet paste by the experienced baker and surprisingly like real ones on the tusks of the boar hung little baskets woven of palm twigs and containing syrian and theban dates 
another carver resembling a jager in full costume now approached the table and with an immense knife commenced cutting up the boar pronounced by lentulus to be a genuine umbrian in the meantime the boys handed the dates and gave to each guest one of the pigs as a souvenir an umbrian said one of the guests of the highest couch turning to the strangers a countryman or at all events a near neighbour of yours then if i were in your place i should hesitate before partaking of it for who knows whether by some metamorphosis one of your dear friends may not have been changed into this animal the days for metamorphoses are past replied one of them there are no more circes and the other gods do not trouble themselves much about mankind i know only one who potently rules all the world and can doubtless bring about many metamorphoses do not say so pomponius quickly added our friend bassus will teach you directly that many wonders happen even in the present times and that we are by no means sure that we shall not see one amongst us suddenly assume the character of a beast laugh as you will said bassus it still cannot be denied only the other day one who was formerly a slave to a man in humble circumstances at capua but has now become a rich freedman related to me a circumstance which he had himself experienced it is enough to make one's hair stand on end if not displeasing to you i will communicate it the company partly from curiosity and partly wishing for a laugh against bassus begged him to tell the story and he thus began when i was a slave related my informant i happened by the dispensation of the gods to conceive a liking for an innkeeper's wife not from an unworthy passion but because she never denied me what i asked for and anything i saved and gave into her charge i was sure not to be cheated of her husband had a small villa at the fifth milestone and as it chanced fell sick there and died in misfortune thought i we know our friends and therefore considered how i could get to my friend at the villa my master was by accident absent from capua but a stranger a warrior was stopping in our house of him i made a confidant begging that he would accompany me in the night to the villa and he consented to do so we waited for the time of the cock crowing and then stole off the moon was shining and it was as clear as midday about half-way by the side of the road was a group of sepulchral monuments at which my companion stopped on some pretence or other but i went on beginning a song and gazing at the stars at length i looked round and saw my companion standing in the road he took off his clothes and laid them down then went around them in a circle spat three times upon them and immediately became a wolf now do not suppose that i am telling you falsehood for the fellow assured me that it was pure truth he next continued the man began to howl and then dashed into the thicket at first i did not know what to do but at length approached for the purpose of taking the clothes with me but behold they had become stone horror-stricken i drew my sword and continued slashing it about in the air until i reached the villa i entered the house breathless the sweat dropped from me and it was long before i recovered myself my friend was astonished at my visiting her at such an unusual hour had you only come sooner said she you might have assisted us for a wolf has been breaking into the villa and destroying several sheep but he did not escape with impunity for my slave has pierced him through with a spear i shuddered and could not obtain my sleep during the night as soon as it was day i hastened homewards and saw on reaching the place where the clothes had lain nothing more than a large stain of blood but found the warrior lying in bed at home and a surgeon bandaging his neck i then became aware that he was one of those whom we call werewolves and could never afterwards eat bread in his company this was the man's story in recounting which he even then shuddered say what you will such things often happen the company laughed and jeered at the narrator who endeavoured by philosophical arguments to defend his credulity at length the second perusian who sat in the lowest place said bassus may not be so very wrong after all for some time since i bought a slave who had formerly lived at miletus and who told me a wonderful story in the following words in the house where i served a child a boy beautiful as a statue had died his mother was inconsolable and all were standing mourning round the bed when the witches were heard shrieking round the house there was in the family a cappadocian a tall daring fellow who had once overcome a mad ox this man having seized a sword ran out of doors with his left hand cautiously concealed in his mantle and cut one of the hags in two we heard their shrieks although we saw nothing but the cappadocian staggered backwards upon a couch and his whole body became as blue as if he had been beaten 
for he had been touched by the hands of the witches he closed the house door again but when the mother returned to her dead child she saw with horror that the sligi had already taken away the body and left a straw doll in its place this anecdote was received with no less laughter than the other bassus alone bent unobserved towards the table and inwardly besought the sligi not to meet him on his way home some more stories of a similar kind would perhaps have been introduced had not the slaves produced a fresh platter which to the astonishment of the company contained a vast swine cooked exactly like the boar ha cried lentulus rising from his couch in order to inspect it more closely i really believe that the cook has forgotten to disembowel the animal bring him thither directly the cook appeared with troubled mien and confessed to the indignation of the whole party that in his hurry he had forgotten to cleanse the beast now really said the enraged sicilius that is the most worthless slave i ever beheld who ever heard of a cook omitting to gut a swine were he mine i would hang him lentulus however was more leniently disposed you deserve a severe chastisement said he to the slave and may thank my good humour for escaping it but as a punishment you must immediately perform the neglected duty in our presence the cook seized the knife and having carefully slid open the belly on both sides gave a sudden jerk when to the agreeable surprise of the guests a quantity of little sausages of all kinds tumbled out that was indeed a new joke cried pomponius laughing but tell me why did you have a tame swine served up after the wild boar if the remainder of my friends be of that opinion replied the host we will grant him his liberty and he may appear to-morrow at my table with his cap on on a given signal the slaves removed the dish and brought another containing peacocks pheasants the livers of geese and rare fish at length this course also was removed the slaves wiped the table and cleared away with besoms of palm twigs the fragments that had fallen on the floor strewing it at the same time with sawdust dyed with vermilion and pleasant smelling saffron whilst this was being done the eyes of the guests were suddenly attracted upwards by a noise overhead the ceiling opened and a large silver hoop on which were ointment bottles of silver and alabaster silver garlands with beautifully chiselled leaves and circlets and other trifles to be shared among the guests as favours descended upon the table in the meantime the dessert had been served wherein the new baker whom lentulus had purchased for a hundred thousand sesterces footnote about five thousand dollars in the footnote gave a specimen of his skill in addition to innumerable articles of pastry there were artificial mussels field fares filled with dried grapes and almonds and many other things of the same kind in the middle stood a well modelled vertumnus footnote a harvest god end of footnote who held in his apron a great variety of fruits around lay sweet quinces stuck full of almonds and having the appearance of sea urchins with melons cut into various shapes whilst the party was praising the fancy of the baker a slave handed round toothpicks made of the leaves of the mastich pistachio and lentulus invited the guests to assist themselves to the confectionery and fruits with which the god was loaded the perusians who were particularly astonished by the gifts of vertumnus at such a season stretched across the table and seized the inviting apples and grapes but drew back in a fright when as they touched them a stream of saffron discharged from the fruit besprinkled them their merriment became general when several of the guests attempted cautiously to help themselves to the mysterious fruit and each time a red stream shot forth you seem determined exclaimed pomponius to surprise us in every way but yet i must say lentulus that in this otherwise excellent entertainment you have not sufficiently provided for our amusement here we are at dessert without having had a single spectacle to delight our eyes between the courses it is not my fault replied lentulus for our friend gallus has deprecated all the feats of rope dancing and pantomime that i intended for you and you see how little he shares in the conversation besides the sun is already nigh setting and i have had another triclinium lighted up for us if no one will take more of the dessert we may as well i think repair thither at once perhaps the cloud which shades the countenance of our friend may disappear under the garland leave the falernian alone at present the Uranus, and await us in the other saloon the youth did as his lord commanded and just at that moment calpurnius entered pouting discontentedly at the servile souls of the company he had left because he could no longer endure their hail to the father of our fatherland the party now rose to meet again after a short time in the brilliant saloon the intervening moments being spent 
by some in sauntering along the colonnades and by others in taking a bath these first scenes of the feast are now followed by drinking gambling and finally by a quarrel and the departure of the guests end of section seventy nine this recording is in the public domain section eighty of greece and rome this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by april six zero nine zero california united states of america the world story volume four greece and rome edited by eva march tappan section eighty the country house of pliny the younger end of the first century a d described by himself you are surprised that i am so fond of my laurentine or if you prefer the name my laurens but you will cease to wonder when i acquaint you with the beauty of the villa the advantages of its situation and the extensive view of the sea-coast it is only seventeen miles from rome so that when i have finished my business in town i can pass my evenings here after a good satisfactory day's work there are two different roads to it if you go by that of laurentum you must turn off at the fourteenth milestone if by ostia at the eleventh both of them are sandy in places which makes it a little heavier and longer by carriage but short and easy on horseback the landscape affords plenty of variety the view in some places being closed in by woods in others extending over broad meadows where numerous flocks of sheep and herds of cattle which the severity of the winter has driven from the mountains fatten in the spring warmth and on the rich pasturage my villa is of a convenient size without being expensive to keep up the courtyard in front is plain but not mean through which you enter porticos shaped into the form of the letter d enclosing a small but cheerful area between these make a capital retreat for bad weather not only as they are shut in with windows but particularly as they are sheltered by a projection of the roof from the middle of these porticos you pass into a bright pleasant inner court and out of that into a handsome hall running out towards the seashore so that when there is a southwest breeze it is gently washed with waves which spend themselves at its base on every side of this hall there are either folding doors or windows equally large by which means you have a view from the front and the two sides of three different seas as it were from the back you see the middle court the portico and the area and from another point you look through the portico into the courtyard and out upon the woods and distant mountains beyond on the left hand of this hall a little farther from the sea lies a large drawing-room and beyond that a second of a smaller size which has one window to the rising and another to the setting sun this as well has a view of the sea but more distant and agreeable the angle formed by the projection of the dining-room with this drawing-room retains and intensifies the warmth of the sun and this forms our winter quarters and family gymnasium which is sheltered from all the winds except those which bring on clouds but the clear sky comes out again before the warmth has gone out of the place adjoining this angle is a room forming the segment of a circle the windows of which are so arranged as to get the sun all through the day in the walls are contrived a sort of cases containing a collection of authors who can never be read too often next to this is a bedroom connected with it by a raised passage furnished with pipes which supply at a wholesome temperature and distribute to all parts of this room the heat they receive the rest of this side of the house is appropriated to the use of my slaves and freedmen but most of the rooms in it are respectable enough to put my guests into in the opposite wing is a most elegant tastefully fitted up bedroom next to which lies another which you may either call a large bedroom or a modified dining room it is very warm and light not only from the direct rays of the sun but by the reflection from the sea beyond this is a bedroom with an ante-room the height of which renders it cool in summer its thick walls warm in winter for it is sheltered every way from the winds to this apartment another ante-room is joined by one common wall from thence you enter into the wide and spacious cooling room belonging to the bath from the opposite walls of which two curved basins are thrown out so to speak 
which are more than large enough if you consider that the sea is close at hand. Adjacent to this is the anointing room, then the sweating room, and beyond that the bath heating room, adjoining are two other little bathrooms, elegantly rather than sumptuously fitted up. Annexed to them is a warm bath of wonderful construction, in which one can swim and take a view of the sea at the same time. Not far from this stands the tennis court, which lies open to the warmth of the afternoon sun. From thence you go up a sort of turret, which has two rooms below, with the same number above, besides a dining room commanding a very extensive lookout onto the sea, the coast, and the beautiful villas scattered along the shoreline. At the other end is a second turret, containing a room that gets the rising and setting sun. Behind this is a large storeroom and granary, and underneath a spacious dining room, where only the murmur and break of the sea can be heard, even in a storm. It looks out upon the garden and the gastadio promenade, running round the garden. The gastadio is bordered round with box, and where that is decayed with rosemary, for the box, wherever sheltered by the buildings, grows plentifully, but where it lies open and exposed to the weather and spray from the sea though at some distance from this latter, it quite withers up. Next to the gestadio, and running along inside it, is a shady vine plantation, the path of which is so soft and easy to tread that you may walk barefoot upon it. The garden is chiefly planted with fig and mulberry trees, to which the soil is as favorable as it is averse from all others. Here is a dining room, which, though it stands away from the sea, enjoys the garden view, which is just as pleasant. Two apartments run round the back part of it, the windows of which look out upon the entrance of the villa, and into a fine kitchen garden. From here extends an enclosed portico, which, from its great length, you might take for a public one. It has a range of windows on either side, but more on the side facing the sea, and fewer on the garden side, and these single windows and alternate with the opposite rows. In calm, clear weather, these are all thrown open but if it blows, those on the weather side are closed, whilst those away from the wind can remain open without any inconvenience. Before this enclosed portico lies a terrace fragrant with the scent of violets, and warmed by the reflection of the sun from the portico, which, while it retains the rays, keeps away the northeast wind, and it is as warm on this side as it is cool on the side opposite. In the same way, it is a protection against the wind from the southwest, and thus, in short, by means of its several sides, breaks the force of the winds, from whatever quarter they may blow. These are some of its winter advantages. They are still more appreciable in the summer time, for at that season it throws a shade upon the terrace during the whole of the forenoon, and upon the adjoining portion of the gestatio and garden in the afternoon, casting a greater or less shade on this side or on that as the day increases or decreases but the portico itself is coolest just at the time when the sun is at its hottest, that is, when the rays fall directly upon the roof. Also, by opening the windows, you let in the western breezes in a free current, which prevents the place getting oppressive with close and stagnant air. At the upper end of the terrace and portico stands a detached garden building, which I call my favorite, my favorite, indeed, as I put it up myself. It contains a very warm winter room, one side of which looks down upon the terrace, while the other has a view of the sea, and both lie exposed to the sun. The bedroom opens on to the covered portico by means of folding doors, while its window looks out upon the sea. On that side next the sea, and facing the middle wall, is formed a very elegant little recess, which, by means of transparent windows and a curtain drawn to or aside, can be made part of the adjoining room, or separated from it, it contains a couch and two chairs. As you lie upon this couch, from where your feet are, you get a peep of the sea. Looking behind you, see the neighboring villas, and from the head you have a view of the woods. Those three views may be seen either separately from so many different windows, or blended together in one. Adjoining this is a bedroom, which neither the servants' voices, the murmuring of the sea, the glare of lightning or daylight itself, can penetrate unless you open the windows. This profound tranquillity and seclusion are occasioned by a passage separating the wall of this room from that of the garden, and thus, by means of this intervening space, every noise is drowned. 
annexed to this is a tiny stove room which by opening or shutting a little aperture lets out or retains the heat from underneath according as you require beyond this is a bedroom and an anteroom which enjoy the sun though obliquely indeed from the time it rises till the afternoon when i retire to this garden summer house i fancy myself a hundred miles away from my villa and take a special pleasure in it at the feast of the saturnalia when by the license of that festive season every other part of my house resounds with my servants mirth thus i neither interrupt their amusement nor they my studies amongst the pleasures and conveniences of this situation there is one drawback and that is the want of running water but then there are wells about the place or rather springs for they lie close to the surface and altogether the quality of this coast is remarkable for dig where you may you meet upon the first turning up of the ground with a spring of water quite pure not in the least salt although so near the sea the neighboring woods supply us with all the fuel we require the other necessaries ostia furnishes indeed to a moderate man even the village between which and my house there is only one villa would supply all ordinary requirements it has three public baths which are a great convenience if it happen that friends come in unexpectedly or make too short a stay to allow time for preparing my own the whole coast is very pleasantly sprinkled with villas either in rows or detached which whether looking at them from the sea or the shore present the appearance of so many different cities the strand is sometimes after a long calm perfectly smooth though in general through the storms driving the waves upon it it is rough and uneven i cannot boast that our sea is plentiful in choice fish however it supplies us with capital soles and prawns but as to other kinds of provisions my villa aspires to excel even inland countries particularly in milk for the cattle come up there from the meadows in large numbers in pursuit of water and shade tell me now have i not good reason for living in staying in loving such a retreat which if you feel no appetite for you must be morbidly attached to town and i only wish you would feel inclined to come down to it that to so many charms with which my little villa abounds it might have the very considerable addition of your company to recommend it farewell end of section eighty this recording is in the public domain Section eighty one of Greece and Rome read for LibriVox dot org by Alan Mapstone Ave Caesar Hail Caesar by E forty Painting page four hundred and ninety The circus of the Romans was simply a race course one or more were always built in every roman city the most celebrated of these was the circus maximus of rome said to have been laid out during the sixth century before christ it was enlarged from time to time during some eight hundred years until the rising tiers of seats would accommodate two hundred and fifty thousand spectators when a chariot race was to take place it was preceded by a procession of cars drawn by horses or elephants, and in these cars were images of the gods and of the deified emperors. The people stood clapping their hands in applause. The contestants advanced before the throne of Caesar and saluted him. Then, as a signal for the race, a white flag was thrown upon the course and the horses dashed forward. The chariot had two wheels and was at first drawn by two horses, but in later times by four or sometimes three. Usually four chariots raced at once, each driver wearing a different colour. The circus was a great club, a fashionable lounging place, a hall of amusement and a betting ring. Everyone from slave to emperor had his favourite colour and the excitement and rivalry were intense end of section eighty one this recording is in the public domain
section eighty two of greece and rome this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the world's story volume four greece and rome edited by eva march tappan section eighty two the winning of the first masseuse about three ninety one a d by georg ebers the chariot race which is here described is supposed to take place in alexandria at the end of the fourth century at this time the conflict between the christians many of whom were rich and powerful and the worshippers of the old gods was at its height bloody riots were the order of the day just before the race the serapium the magnificent temple of the god serapis had been destroyed by order of the christian bishop theophilus the editor the spacious hippodrome was filled with some thousands of spectators at first many rows of seats had been left vacant though usually on the eve of the great races the people would set out soon after midnight and every place would be filled long before the games began indeed the upper tiers of the tribune which were built of wood and were free to all comers with standing room behind were commonly so crowded early in the morning that the crush ended in a free fight on this occasion the storm of the previous night the anxiety caused by the conflict round the serapium and the prevalent panic as to the approaching end of the world kept great numbers away from their favourite diversion but when the sky recovered its radiant blue and when it became known that the statue of serapis had escaped uninjured in the siege of his sanctuary when cynegius the imperial legate and evagrius the city prefect had entered the theatre with much pomp followed by several senators and ladies and gentlemen of rank christians heathen and jews the most timid took courage the games had been postponed for an hour and before the first team was led into the arched shed whence the chariot started the seats though less densely packed than usual were amply filled the number of chariots entered for competition was by no means smaller than on former occasions for the heathen had strained every nerve to shore their fellow-citizens of different creeds and especially caesar's representative that in spite of persecution and in defiance of imperial edicts they were still a power worthy of consideration the christians on their part did their utmost to outdo the idolaters on the same ground where not long since they had held quite the second place the bishop's epigram that christianity had ceased to be the religion of the poor was amply confirmed the greater proportion of the places for senators officials and rich citizens was occupied by its adherents and the men and women who professed the faith were by no means behind their heathen peers in magnificence of dress and jewels the horses too entered by the christians could not fail to please the connoisseur as they punctually made their appearance behind the starting-place though he might have felt more confidence and not without reason in the heathen steeds and more particularly in their drivers each of whom had won on an average nine races out of ten the horses in the quadriga with which marcus the son of mary made his appearance in the arena had never before been driven in the hippodrome demetrius the owner's brother had bred and trained them for magnificent black arabs and they excited much interest in the knowing judges who were wont to collect and lounge about the apidum as it was called behind the carcaris footnote 
covered sheds wherein the horses waited for the start end of footnote to inspect the racers predict the winner offer counsel to the drivers and make bets these perfect creatures were perhaps as fine as the famous team of golden bays belonging to iphicrates which so often had proved victorious but the agitators or drivers attracted even more interest than the horses marcus though he knew how to handle the reins he had already been seen in experimental races could hardly hold his own against hippias the handsome young heathen who like most of the drivers in the arena was an agitator by profession a story was told of his having driven over a bridge which was not quite as white as the outside edges of his chariot wheels and there were many witnesses to the feat he had performed of writing his mistress's name with his chariot tracks in the sand of the hippodrome the betting was freest and the wages highest on hippias and the team belonging to iphicrates some few backed marcus and his arabs but for smaller sums and when they compared the tall but narrow-shouldered figure of the young christian with the heroic breadth of hippias's frame and his delicate features dreamy blue eyes and downy black moustache with the powerful hermes head of his rival they were anxious about their money if his brother now the farmer demetrius who was standing by the horses heads or some well-known agitator had held the reins it would have been a pleasure and a profit to back such horses marcus had been abroad too and men shrugged their shoulders over that for it was not till the last few days that he had been seen exercising his horses in the hippodrome time was going on and the imperial envoy who had been elected to preside as judge at length took his place demetrius whispered a few last words of advice to his brother and went back into the arena his stepmother was sitting on the stuffed bench covered with lion skins which was reserved for the family her tunic and skirt displayed the colour blue of the christian charioteer being made of bright blue and silver brocade of a beautiful pattern in which the cross the fish and the olive branch were elegantly combined her black hair was closely and simply smoothed over her temples and she wore no garland but a string of large grey pearls from which hung a chaplet of sapphires and opals lying on her forehead a veil fell over the back of her head and she sat gazing into her lap as if she were absorbed in prayer her hands were folded and held a cross this placid and demure attitude she deemed becoming to a christian matron and widow every one might see that she had not come for worldly pleasure but merely to be present at a triumph of her fellow christians and especially her son over the idolaters everything about her bore witness to the faith even the pattern on her dress and the shape of her ornaments down to the embroidery on her silk gloves in which a cross and an anchor were so designed as to form a greek chi the initial letter of the name of christ her ambition was to appear simple and superior to all worldly vanities still all she wore must be rich and costly for she was here to do honour to her creed she would have regarded it as a heathen abomination to wear wreaths of fresh and fragrant flowers though for the money which that string of pearls had cost she might have decked the circus with garlands from end to end or have fed a hundred poor for a twelvemonth it seemed so much easier to cheat the omniscient creator of the universe than our fellow fools there was music as usual in the towers at either end of the row of carcaris but it was less stirring and cheerful than of yore for flutes and several of the heathen airs had been prohibited formerly too the hippodrome had been a place where 
lovers could meet and where many a love affair had been brought to a happy climax but to-day none of the daughters of the more respectable families were allowed to quit the woman's apartments in their own homes for danger was in the air the course of events in the serapium had kept many of the younger men from witnessing the races and some mysterious influence seemed to weigh upon the gaiety and mirth of which the hippodrome on a gallant day was usually the headquarters wild excitement expectation strung to the highest pitch and party feeling both for and against had always of course been rife here but to-day they were manifest in an acuter form hatred had added its taint and lent virulence to every emotion the heathen were oppressed and angered their rights abridged and defied they saw the christians triumphant at every point and hatred is a protean monster which rages most fiercely and most venomously when it has lurked in the foul career of envy the christians could hate too and they hated the idolaters who gloried with haughty self-sufficiency in their intellectual inheritance the traditions of a brilliant past they who had been persecuted and contemned now had the upper hand they were in power and the more insolently they treated their oppressors the more injustice they did them and the less the victimized heathen were able to avenge themselves the more bitterly did the christians detest the party they contemned as superstitious idolaters in their care for the soul the spiritual and divine part the christians had hitherto neglected graces of the body thus the heathen had remained undisputed masters of the palestra and the hippodrome in the gymnasium the christian refused even to compete for the exhibition of his naked body he regarded as an abomination but on the race course he had lately been willing to display his horses and many times had disputed the crown with the hereditary victors so that even here the heathen felt his time-honoured and undisputed supremacy endangered this was intolerable this must be averted the mere thought of being beaten on this ground roused the idolaters to wrath and malice they displayed their colour in wreaths of scarlet poppies pomegranate flowers and red roses with crimson ribbons and dresses white and green the colours formerly adopted by the competitors were abandoned for all the heathen were unanimous in combining their forces against the common foe the ladies used red sunshades and the very baskets in which the refreshments were brought for the day were painted red the widow mary on the other hand and all the christians were robed in blue from head to foot their sandals being tied with blue ribbons and dada's blue shoulder knot was in conspicuous contrast to her bright rose-coloured dress the vendors of food who wandered round the circus had eggs dyed blue and red cakes with sugared icing and refreshing drinks in jars of both colours when a christian and a heathen found themselves seated side by side each turned a shoulder to the other or if they were forced to sit face to face eyed each other with a scowl cynegius did all he could to postpone the races as long as possible he was anxious to wait till the comes had finished his task in the serapium so that the troops might be free to act in any emergency that might arise before the contests in the hippodrome were fairly ended time did not hang heavy on his hands for the vast multitude here assembled interested him greatly though he had frequently been a spectator of similar festivities in rome and constantinople but this crowd differed in many particulars from the populace of those cities in the topmost tiers of free seats black and brown faces predominated greatly over white ones in the cushioned and carpeted ranks of the stone podium 
the lower portion of the amphitheatre mingled with greeks and egyptians sat thousands of splendidly dressed men and women with strongly marked semitic features members of the wealthy jewish community whose venerable head the alabarch a dignified patriarch in greek dress sat with the chief members of the senate near the envoy's tribune the alexandrians were not a patient race and they were beginning to rebel against the delay making no small noise and disturbance when cynegius rose and with his white handkerchief waved the signal for the races to begin the number of spectators had gradually swelled from fifty to sixty and to eighty thousand and no less than thirty-six chariots were waiting behind the carcass ready to start four missus or races were to be run in each of the three first twelve chariots were to start and in the fourth only the leaders in the three former ones were to compete the winner of the olive wreath and palm branch in this final heat would bear the honours of the day his party would be victorious and he would quit the hippodrome in triumph lots were now drawn in the oppidum to decide which shed each chariot was to start from and in which missus each was to run it was marcus's fate to start among the first lot and to the horror of those who had backed his chances hippias the hero of the hippodrome was his rival with the four famous bays heathen priests poured libations to poseidon and phoebus apollo the patron divinities of horses and of the hippodrome for sacrifices of blood were prohibited while christian presbyters and exorcists blessed the rival steeds in the name of the bishop a few monks had crept in but they were turned out by the heathen with bitter jests as unbidden intruders cynegius repeated his signal the sound of the tuba rang through the air and the first twelve chariots were led into the starting sheds a few minutes later a machine was set in motion by which a bronze eagle was made to rise with outspread wings high into the air from an altar in front of the carcass this was the signal for the chariots to come forth from their boxes they took up their positions close behind a broad chalk line traced on the ground with diagonal slope so as to reduce the disadvantage of standing outermost and having a larger curve to cover until this moment only the privileged possessors of the seats over the carcass had been able by craning backwards to see the horses and drivers now the competitors were visible to the multitude which at their first appearance broke out into vociferous applause the agitators had to exert all their strength to hold in the startled and eager teams and make them stand even for a few short minutes then cynegius signalled for the third time a golden dolphin which had been suspended from a beam and on which the eye of every charioteer was fixed dropped to the ground a blast on the salpinks or war trumpet was sounded and forty-eight horses flew forth as though thrown forward by one impulsion the strength of four fine horses whirled each light two-wheeled chariot over the hard causeway as though it were a toy the downpour of the previous night had laid the dust the bright sunshine sparkled and danced in rapidly changing flashes mirrored in the polished gilding of the bronze or the silver fittings of the elegantly decorated semicircular cars in which the drivers stood five blue and seven red competitors had drawn the first lot the eye rested with pleasure on the sinewy figures whose bare feet seemed rooted to the boards they stood in while their eyes were riveted on the goal they were striving to reach though as the eye of the archer sees arrow bow and mark all at once they never lost sight of the horses they were guiding a close cap with floating ribbons confined their hair and they wore a short sleeveless tunic swathed round the body with wide bands as if to brace their muscles and add to their strength 
the reins were fastened around their hips so as to leave the hands free not only to hold them but also to ply the whip and use the goad each charioteer had a knife in his girdle to enable him to release himself in case of accident from a bond that might prove fatal before long the bay team was leading alone behind were two christian drivers followed by three red chariots marcus was last of all but it was easy to see that it was by choice and not by necessity that he was hanging back he was holding in his fiery team with all his strength and weight his body thrown back his feet firmly set with his knees against the silver bar of the chariot and his hands gripping the reins in a few minutes he came flying past dada and his brother but he did not see them he had not even caught sight of his own mother while the professional charioteers had not failed to bow to cynegius and nod to their friends he could only keep his eyes and mind fixed on his horses and on the goal the multitude clapped roared shouted encouragement to their party hissed and whistled when they were disappointed venting their utmost indignation on marcus as he came past behind the others but he either heard them not or would not hear dada's heart beat so wildly that she thought it would burst she could not sit still she started to her feet and then flung herself back on her cushions shouting some spurring words to marcus in the flash of time when he might perhaps hear them when he had passed her head fell and she said sadly enough poor fellow we have brought our wreaths for nothing after all demetrius but demetrius shook his head and smiled nay he said the boy has iron sinews in that slight body look how he holds the horses in he is saving their strength till they need it seven times child seven times he has to go round this great circus and pious the nissa footnote the turning post or goal in the footnote you will see he will catch up what he has lost yet hippias you see is holding in his horses too it is his way of giving himself airs at the starting now he is close to the nissa the meta they call it at rome the smaller the bend he can make round it the better for him but it is risky work there you see they drive round from right to left and that throws most of the work on the left-hand beast it has to turn almost in its own length aura our first horse is as supple as a panther and i trained her to do it myself now look out there that bronze figure of a rearing horse the taraxippos they call it is put there to frighten the horses and megira our third horse is like a mad thing sometimes though she can go like a stag every time marcus gets her quietly past the taraxippos we are nearer to success look look the first chariot has got round the nyssa it is hippias yes by zeus he has done it he is a detestable braggart but he knows his business this was one of the decisive moments of the race the crowd was silent expectation was at the utmost pitch of tension and dada's eyes were fixed spellbound on the obelisk and on the quadriga that whirled round the bourn next to hippias came a blue team and close behind him were three red ones the christian who had succeeded in reaching the nyssa second boldly took his horses close round the obelisk hoping to gain space and get past hippias but the left wheel of his chariot grazed the granite plinth the light car was overset and the horses of the red chariot whose noses were almost on his shoulder could not be pulled up short in time they fell over the christian's team which rolled on the ground the red chariot too turned over and eight snorting beasts lay struggling in the sand the horses in the next chariot bolted as they were being driven past this mass of plunging and neighing confusion they defied their driver's impotent efforts and galloped across the course back into the carkers the rest had time and space enough to beware of the wreck and to give it a wide berth among them marcus the melee at the meta had excited his steeds almost beyond control and as they tore past the taraxippos the third horse megira shied violently as demetrius had predicted she flung herself on one side thrust her hindquarters under the pole and kicked desperately lifting the chariot quite off the ground the young charioteer lost his footing and slipped 
dada covered her face with her hands and his mother turned pale and knit her brows with apprehension the youth was still standing his feet were on the sand of the arena but he had a firm grip on the right-hand spiral ornament that terminated the bar round the chariot many a heart stood still with anxiety and shouts of triumph and mockery broke from the red party but in less than half a minute by an effort of strength and agility he had his knees on the footboard and then in the winking of an eye he was on his feet in the chariot had gathered up the reins and was rushing onward meanwhile however hippias had far outstripped all the rest and as he flew past the carkers he checked his pace snatched a cup from a lemonade cellar tossed the contents down his throat with haughty audacity amid the plaudits of the crowd and then dashed on again a wide gap indeed still lay between him and marcus by the time the competitors again came round to the nyssa the slaves in attendance had cleared away the broken chariots and led off the horses a christian still came next to hippias followed by a red agitator marcus had gained on the others and was now fourth in the third round the chariot of the red driver in front of marcus made too sharp a turn and ran up against the granite the broken car was dragged on by the terrified beasts and the charioteer with it till by the time they were stopped he was a corpse in the fifth circuit the christian who till now had been second to hippias shared the same fate though he escaped with his life and then marcus drove past the starting sheds next to hippias hippias had ceased to flout and dally in spite of the delay that marcus had experienced from the taraxippos the space that parted his bays from the black arabs had sensibly diminished round after round and the interest of the race now centred entirely in him and the young christian never before had so passionate and reckless a contest been fought out on this venerable race-course and the throng of spectators were carried away by the almost frenzied rivalry of the two drivers not a creature in the upper tiers had been able to keep his seat men and women alike had risen to their feet and were shouting and roaring to the competitors the music in the towers might have ceased so completely was it drowned by the tumult in the amphitheatre only the ladies in the best places above the starting sheds preserved their aristocratic calm still when the seventh and decisive round was begun even the widow mary leaned forward a little and clasped her hands more tightly over the cross in her lap each time that marcus had driven round the obelisk or past the taraxippos dada had clutched her head with her hands and set her teeth in her lip each time as he happily steered clear of the fatal stone and whirled past the dreadful bronze statue she had relaxed her grip and leaned back in her seat with a sigh of relief her sympathy made her one with marcus she felt as if his loss must be her death and his victory her personal triumph during the sixth circuit hippias was still a long way ahead of the young christian the distance which lay between marcus and the team of bays seemed to have become a fixed quantity for do what he could he could not diminish it by a hand-breath the two agitators had now completely altered their tactics instead of holding their horses in they urged them onward leaning over the front of their chariot speaking to the horses shouting at them with hoarse breathless cries and flogging them unsparingly steamy sweat and lathering foam streaked the flanks of the desperate labouring brutes while clouds of dust were flung up from the dry furrowed and trampled soil the other chariots were left farther and farther behind those of hippias and marcus and when for the seventh and last time these two were nearing the nyssa the crowd for a moment held its breath only to break out into louder and wilder cries and then again to be hushed it seemed as though their exhausted lungs found renewed strength to shout with double energy when their excitement had kept them silent for a while dada spoke no more pale and gasping she sat with her eyes fixed on the tall obelisk and on the cloud of dust which as the chariots neared the nyssa seemed to grow denser at about a hundred paces from the nyssa she saw above the sandy curtain the red cap of hippias flash past and then close behind it the blue cap worn by marcus then a deafening thundering roar from thousands of throats went up to heaven while round the obelisk so close to it that not a horse not a wheel could have found room between the plinth and the driver the blue cap came forward out of the cloud 
and behind it now no longer in front though not more than a length behind came the red cap of hippias when within a few feet of the nyssa marcus had overtaken his antagonist had passed the point with a bold and perilously close turn and had left the bays behind him demetrius saw it all as though his eyes had power to pierce the dust cloud and now he too lost his phlegmatic calm he threw up his arms as if in prayer and shouted as though his brother could hear him well done splendid boy now for the kentron the goad drive it in send it home if they die for it give it them well dada who could only guess what was happening looked round at him asking in tremulous tones has he passed him is he gaining on him will he win but demetrius did not answer he only pointed to the foremost of the flying clouds on which the second was fast advancing and cried in a frenzy of excitement death in hades the other is catching him up the dog the sneak if only the boy would use his goad give it them marcus give it them lad never give in now great father poseidon there there no i can hardly stand yes he is still in front and now now this must settle it thunder and lightning they are close together again may the dust choke him no it is all right my arabs are in front all is well keep it up lad well done we have won the horses were pulled up the dust settled marcus the christian had won the first missus cynegius held out the crown to the victor who bowed to receive it then he waved his hand to his mother who graciously waved hers in return and he drove into the opium and was lost to sight hippias flung down his whip in a rage but the triumphant shouts of the christians drowned the music the trumpet blasts and the angry murmurs of the defeated heathen threatening fists were shaken in the air while behind the carcaris the drivers and owners of the red party scolded squabbled and stormed and hippias who by his audacious swagger had given away the race to their hated foe to the blues the christians narrowly escaped being torn in pieces the second and third masseuse like the first were marked by serious accidents both however were won for the red party in the fourth the decisive race there were but three competitors marcus and the two heathen winners demetrius watched it with less anxiety he knew that his arabs were far superior to the egyptian breed in staying power and they also had the advantage of having had a longer rest in fact the final victory was adjudged to the young christian End of section eighty two this recording is in the public domain section eighty three of greece and rome read for librivox dot org rome part eight the grandeur that was rome historical note the twelve caesars were followed by nerva trajan hadrian antoninus pius and marcus aurelius antoninus the five good emperors as they are called who ruled from ninety six a d to one hundred and eighty a d Trajan had the old ambition to make conquests and extend the possessions of the Romans, but when Hadrian came to the throne, he more wisely aimed at strengthening what they already had. The two Antonines held for a single aim the welfare and happiness of their people, quite a new idea in that age. Rome was a mighty empire, not only in her wide-spreading lands and her tribute nations, but in other ways. Her methods of building were, indeed, copied from the Greek, but with a wise adaptation to local needs that amounted to originality. Her literature is rich in great names, poets, satirists, historians, and philosophers. But in the science of law she is without a rival. There is no civilized country in the world whose laws have not been influenced by those of Rome. The wonderfully made Roman roads were not only highways of conquest and necessities of warfare, but they were a means by which her civilization was carried to peoples whom the wise management of their conqueror made eager to embrace her teachings. And yet, in this marvelously successful Roman Empire, there were elements that were working her ruin. So many men had been slain in the wars and proscriptions that there was a lack of citizens. Slaves were cheap, and the Romans despised work. Barbarians were pressing close upon the empire. The army was demoralized but it was the only power, and no one could be made emperor who was not the choice of the soldiers. Only thirteen years after the death of Marcus Aurelius Antoninus, the throne of the mighty Roman Empire was sold at auction and knocked down to the highest bidder. End of Section 83 This recording is in the public domain.
Section 84 of Greece and Rome. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Laura Larson. The World's Story, Volume 4. Greece and Rome. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 84. Marcus Aurelius, the Philosopher Emperor. 121 through 180 A.D. by Eva March Tappan. A Roman emperor was one day thinking over his childhood, and he concluded that he had been an exceedingly fortunate boy. His father died when he was a baby, it was true, but he wrote in his notebook that he had good grandfathers, good parents, a good sister, good teachers, good associates, good kinsmen, and friends. About his teachers he wrote a great deal more. He did not say that one taught him arithmetic, one poetry, and so on, but he said that from one he had learned not to meddle with other people's affairs, from another not to spend his time on trifles, from another to be willing to forgive, and from the others to keep himself from fault-finding, to be cheerful, to love truth and justice, not to declare often that he had no leisure, and not to excuse neglect of his duties to others by saying that he was busy. This emperor's name as a boy was Marcus Aeneas Verus. He belonged to a noble family and was called to the attention of the emperor Hadrian when he was a little fellow. The child was so noble and upright that Hadrian said his name ought not to be Verus, true, but Verissimus, truest. When this young Marcus was about twelve, he became interested in a kind of philosophy known as Stoicism. He made up his mind that its teachings were good and that he would follow them as long as he lived and what is more, he did not change his belief. Some of the precepts of Stoicism are as follows. One ought never to complain, but to yield to necessity calmly and serenely. One ought not to allow himself to be overwhelmed with grief or enraptured with joy. One should never make pleasure his aim. The Stoics dressed simply and lived plainly. They were taught to treat all men alike, whether great or small. They were to work hard, to practice self-denial, and never to listen to slander. All this time the Emperor Hadrian was watching the young Stoic. He had no son, and he was trying to decide who should follow him as emperor. Marcus was only seventeen, or probably Hadrian would have chosen him. He did choose Antoninus, an uncle of the boy, a man of about fifty years. He was upright and just, and had gentle, kindly manners. He was not eager to undertake so great a labor as the care of a mighty empire. But finally he yielded. Hadrian made one condition to Antoninus's becoming his heir, and this was that he should adopt as his successors the young Marcus and also one Lucius Verus, whose father had been a friend of Hadrian. Soon after the agreement was made, Hadrian died, and Antoninus took his place. For more than twenty years Marcus Aurelius Antoninus, as he was now called, lived with his uncle. Antoninus loved him like a father, and gave him a large part in the government, and honored him in every way in his power. Antoninus was a good man. He always tried to be at peace with everyone and to treat everyone justly. He kept the empire in order and kept himself cheerful and serene, and he was greatly loved by his nephew. When the time came that Antoninus knew he must die, he called together the chief men of Rome to talk about who should be his successor. He had two sons of his own, but he did not try to win the empire for them. He recommended that the Senate should choose Marcus. Evidently, he could not make up his mind to recommend Lucius Verus also. The Senate agreed with him and asked Marcus Aurelius to become sole emperor. He knew that it was Hadrian's wish that Verus should reign together with him, and he insisted that this should be done. Verus was somewhat weak in character and had little idea of self-control but he did have a great respect for Marcus Aurelius, and was always ready to follow his advice. They ruled together in perfect harmony until the death of Verus. All sorts of troubles afflicted the empire. First of all, there was a terrible flood. Much of Rome was swept away. Fields and crops were destroyed, and cattle were drowned. There were fires and there were earthquakes. Worst of all, there was war, and Marcus Aurelius had a horror of war. He thought that it was a shame and disgrace. Nevertheless, he was emperor, and he had to protect his empire. The Parthians in the east revolted. They were overcome in battle. But when the army returned, a dreadful pestilence came with them. It spread from region to region. It is the end of the empire, people whispered fearfully. 
but at length the plague disappeared. Then there was danger from the Germans, and Marcus Aurelius remained in camp and on the battlefield for three years before they were subdued. This emperor fought because it was necessary, but he loved quiet thought, and wherever he was, he carried with him his little notebook, and in it he wrote any thoughts that came to him about the noblest way to live. It was at this time that he jotted down between battles his memories of his childhood and of the goodness of his friends and teachers. He wrote that of course he must expect to meet ungrateful, envious, deceitful people, but that they could not really do him any harm, and that the only reason why they were of such character was because they did not fully understand what was good and what was bad. This little notebook of the busy emperor is very interesting. He tells people that they ought not to waste their lives in wondering what others are saying and thinking, and that their own thoughts ought always be so kindly that if anyone asked, what are you thinking about? they would not be at all afraid to answer honestly. He says that when anyone wants to feel happy, it is an excellent plan to think of his friends and call to mind their good qualities. Think more of the good things you have than of those you have not, he advises. Another thought is that the best way to avenge oneself is to be careful not to become like the wrongdoer. He makes it seem not only wrong but exceedingly silly to continue in ill-doing, for he says, it is a ridiculous thing for a man not to fly from his own badness, which is indeed possible, but to fly from other men's badness, which is impossible. Marcus Aurelius would have liked to spend his time thinking about life and setting down his thoughts in this way, and in being with his family and his friends, but he could spare only stray moments for such pleasures. He had to give his days either to war or to thinking how to take care of the roads, how to manage the city at less expense— how to get enough soldiers and how to pay those he already had, and how to answer the hundred and one questions that came up every day for his decision. It is no wonder that he had to rise early in the morning and work till after midnight. He was obliged to show himself at the games and the fights of the gladiators, but while he was there, he usually read or had someone read to him. During the reign of Marcus Aurelius, the Christians were terribly persecuted. It often happened that the most bitter persecutions took place during the reigns of the best emperors, and so it was with Marcus Aurelius. Although his ideas were much like those of Christianity, he probably knew nothing of the Christian belief and was a sincere worshipper of the gods. When any trouble came upon the state, the first thought of both him and his people was that the state worship had not been carried on properly, and so the gods were angry. The Christians would not even burn a few grains of incense on the heathen altars, and therefore, when flood or sickness afflicted the city, the Romans believed that they were to blame and ought to be persecuted. When Marcus Aurelius was nearly sixty years old, a pestilence made its appearance in the army, and soon the Romans were grieving over the loss of their ruler. It had become the custom for the Senate to pass a decree at the death of an emperor, declaring that he was now one of the gods. But in this case, the people did not wait for any decree of the Senate. They made a god of him at once, and for many years incense was burned before his statue, and prayers were offered up to the emperor whom they loved so sincerely. End of section 84. This recording is in the public domain. Section 85 of Greece and Rome. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 4, Greece and Rome, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 85. Queen Zenobia and the Roman Ambassadors. 273 A.D. By William Ware When the Romans were endeavoring to conquer the Parthians, they were aided by Odenitus, king of Palmyra, an oasis in the desert of Syria. He was rewarded by so many honors that he began to think himself great enough to establish a kingdom whose power should equal that of Rome in her palmiest days. At his death, his wife, Zenobia, attempted to carry out his plans, and took the title of Queen of the East. The Emperor Aurelian, 
mindful of the long-continued friendship between the two realms, at first only sent ambassadors to try to persuade her to limit her ambition to her own kingdom of Palmyra. The Editor Hardly were we arrived at the lawn in front of the palace, when a cloud of dust was observed to rise in the direction of the road to Palmyra, as if caused by a body of horse in rapid movement. "'What may this mean?' said Zenobia. "'Orders were strict, that our brief retirement should not be disturbed. This indicates an errand of some urgency.' Some embassy from abroad, perhaps, said Julia, that cannot brook delay. It may be from your great brother at Rome. While we, in a sportive humor, indulged in various conjectures, an official of the palace announced the approach of a Roman herald, who craved permission to address the Queen of Palmyra. He was ordered to advance. In a few moments, Upon a horse, covered with dust and foam, appeared the Roman herald. Without one moment's hesitancy, he saw Zenobia, the queen. Then, taking off his helmet, said that Caius Petronius and Cornelius Varro, ambassadors of Aurelian, were in waiting at the outer gates of the palace and asked a brief audience of the queen of Palmyra upon affairs of deepest interest, both to Zenobia and the Emperor. "'It is not our custom,' said Zenobia in reply. "'When seeking repose, as now, from the cares of state, to allow aught to break it. "'But we will not be selfish or churlish. "'Bid the servants of your Emperor draw near, and we will hear them.' I was not unwilling that the messengers of Aurelian should see Zenobia, just as she was now, sitting upon her noble Arabian, and leaning upon her hunting spear, her countenance glowing with a higher beauty than ever before, as it seemed to me, her head surmounted with the Parthian hunting cap, from which drooped a single ostrich feather, springing from a diamond worth a nation's rental her costume also Parthian, and revealing in the most perfect manner the just proportions of her form. I thought I had never seen even her, when she so filled and satisfied the eye and the mind. And for that moment I was almost a traitor to Aurelian. Had Julia filled her seat, I should have been quite so. As it was... I could worship her who sat her steed with no less grace upon the left of the queen, without being guilty of that crime. On Zenobia's right were Longinus and Zabdus, Gracchus and the other noblemen of Palmyra. Fausta and I were near Julia. In this manner, just as we had come in from the chase, did we await the ambassadors of Aurelian. Announced by trumpets, and followed by their train, they soon wheeled into the lawn, and advanced toward the queen. Caius Petronius and Cornelius Varro, said Zenobia, first addressing the ambassadors, and moving toward them a few paces. We bid you heartily welcome to Palmyra. If we receive you thus without form, you must take the blame partly to yourselves, who have sought us with haste. We put by the customary observances, that we may cause you no delay. These whom you see are all friends or counsellors. Speak your errand without restraint. We come, replied Petronius, as you may surmise, great queen upon no pleasing errand. Yet we cannot but persuade ourselves that the Queen of Palmyra will listen to the proposals of Aurelian, and preserve the good understanding which has lasted so long between the West and the East. There have been brought already to your ears, if I have been rightly informed, rumors of dissatisfaction on the part of our Emperor with the affairs of the East, 
and of plans of an eastern expedition. It is my business now to say that these rumors have been well founded. I am further to say that the object at which Aurelian has aimed in the preparations he has made is not Persia, but Palmyra. He does us too much honor, said Zenobia, her color rising and her eyes kindling. And what, may I ask, are specifically his demands and the price of peace? For a long series of years, said the ambassador, the wealth of Egypt and the East, as you are aware, flowed into the Roman treasury. That stream has been diverted to Palmyra. Egypt and Syria and Bithynia and Mesopotamia were dependents upon Rome and Roman provinces. It is needless to say what they are now. The Queen of Palmyra was once but the Queen of Palmyra. She is now Queen of Egypt and of the East. Augusta of the Roman Empire, her sons styled and arrayed as Caesars. By whatever consent of former emperors these honors have been won or permitted, it is not, we are required to say, with the consent of Aurelian. By whatever service and behalf of Rome they may, in the judgment of some, be thought to be deserved, in the judgment of Aurelian, the reward exceeds greatly the value of the service rendered. But, while he would not be deemed insensible to those services, and while he honors the greatness and the genius of Zenobia, he would, he conceives, be unfaithful to the interests of those who have raised him to his high office if he did not require that in the East, as in the West, the Roman Empire should again be restored to the limits which bounded it in the reigns of the virtuous Antoninus. This he holds essential to his own honor and the glory of the Roman world. You have delivered yourself, Caius Petronius, replied the queen in a calm and firm voice, as it became a Roman to do, with plainness, and as I must believe without reserve. So far I honor you. Now hear me, and as you hear, so report to him who sent you. Tell Aurelian that what I am, I have made myself, and that the empire which hails me queen had been molded into what it is by Odenitus and Zenobia. It is no gift, but an inheritance, a conquest and a possession. It is held not by favor, but by right of birth and power and that when he will give away possessions or provinces which he claims as his or Rome's for the asking, I will give away Egypt and the Mediterranean coast. Tell him that as I have lived a queen, so the gods helping, I will die a queen, that the last moment of my reign and my life shall be the same. If he is ambitious, let him be told that I am ambitious too. Ambitious of wider and yet wider empire, of an unsullied fame, and of my people's love. Tell him I do not speak of gratitude on the part of Rome, but that posterity will say that the power which stood between Rome and Persia and saved the empire in the east, which avenged the death of Valerian and twice pursued the kings as far as the gates of Tessaphon, deserved some fairer acknowledgement than the message you now bring at the hands of a Roman emperor. Let the queen, quickly rejoined Petronius, but evidently moved by what he had heard. Let the queen fully take me. Aurelian purposes not to invade the fair region where I now am, and where my eyes are rejoiced by this goodly show of city, plain and country. He hails you, Queen of Palmyra. He does but ask again those appendages of your greatness which have been torn from Rome and were once members of her body. 
"'Your emperor is gracious indeed,' replied the queen, smiling. "'If he may hew off my limbs, he will spare the trunk. "'And what were the trunk without the limbs?' "'And is this?' said Petronius, his voice significant of inward grief. "'That which I must carry back to Rome. "'Is there no hope of a better adjustment?' Will not the Queen of Palmyra delay for a few days her final answer? added Varro. I see happily in her train a noble Roman, from whom, as well as from us, she may obtain all needed knowledge of both the character and purposes of Aurelian. We are at liberty to wait her pleasure. You have our thanks, Romans, for your courtesy, and we accept your offer although in what I have said I think I have spoken the sense of my people. You have indeed, great queen, interrupted Zabdas with energy. Yet I owe it to my trusty counsellor, the great Longinus, continued the queen, who thinks not with me to look further into the reasons, which because they are his must be strong ones, by which he supports an opposite judgment. But those reasons have now, said the Greek, lost much or all of their force. Zabdas smiled triumphantly. Yet still I would advocate delay. Let it be so, then, said the queen. And in the meanwhile, let the ambassadors of Aurelian not refuse the hospitalities of the Eastern Queen. Our palace is yours while it shall please you to remain. For the night and the morning, we accept your offers. Then, as strangers in this region, we would return to the city, to see better than we have yet done the objects which it presents. It seemed to us on a hasty glance, surrounded by its luxuriant plains, like the habitation of gods. We would dwell there a space. So saying, Zenobia, putting spurs to her horse, led the way to the palace, followed by a long train of Romans and Palmyrenes. The generous hospitality of the tables closed the day and wore away the night. The visit of the Roman ambassadors to Zenobia was fruitless, for the queen boldly refused to yield any of her territories or to give up her ambition. Then the Roman arms were sent against her, and Palmyra was burned. The queen herself was carried to Rome to grace the triumph of Aurelian. The Editor End of Section 85 This recording is in the public domain. Recording by the Story Girl Section 86 of Greece and Rome This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Story, Volume 4, Greece and Rome, edited by Eva March Tapan. Section number 86 the Roman Roads by J. R. S. Sterrett The width of the Roman road varied much according to its importance. Often it was one hundred and twenty feet wide, though in the provinces it was generally sixty, sometimes forty feet wide. In order to understand the reason for this great width and for the substantial construction that was rigidly adhered to, we should bear in mind the make-up of the Roman army, whose comfort and necessities were continually consulted. In the first place, the Roman soldier was burdened by his heavy armor and other impedimenta in such a manner as to render him wholly unfit to repel sudden attacks successfully, as we read on nearly every page of Caesar's commentaries. The baggage train was far larger and more unwieldy than anything we know of today, for the reason that this train had to transport not merely the tents, artillery, arms, munitions of war, 
army chests and a host of other things necessary in the warfare of that day not merely the effects and plunder of the legionaries but also those of two secondary armies an army of women wives of the legionaries and camp followers and another army of body servants for each legionary had one or more servants so that the calones outnumbered the legionaries themselves when on the march this unwieldy army maintained the line of battle order theoretically at least in order to be ready to repel sudden and unexpected attack good roads therefore were necessary in order to enable the immense train with which the army was handicapped to keep pace with the legionaries and wide roads were essential in order in case of sudden attack to allow the individual legionaries to make effective use of their arms without interfering with their neighbors the roman roads were built with more care than is expended upon the beds of our railways even they were made as straight as possible and natural obstacles were skillfully overcome by the use of cuts fills bridges culverts embankments and even tunnels stiff grades were avoided and the level once reached was doggedly maintained even at the expense of making cuts fills etc the work preliminary to the building of any roman road consisted in excavating all the dirt down to hardpan and the excavation thus made was filled in regardless of expense with layers of sand stone and cement until the requisite level however high it might be had been reached finally the surface was dressed with a layer of metal and cement the road was practically indestructible and required only occasional repairs that continuous or even merely yearly repairs were not necessary seems clear from the fact that when repairs were made the proprietor of the province thought it so important an event that he celebrated it by inscribing the fact along with his name on the milestones many years ago berger made an examination of certain roman roads still in use in france one road was examined at a point where it had been raised twenty feet above the level of the surrounding country and a vertical section revealed a structure of five layers first came the great fill of sixteen feet and one half on the top of this fill were layers of flattish stones mixed with cement flattish stones without cement firmly packed dirt small metal and hard cement and large metal and cement five layers in all the first three of twelve inches each the last two of six inches each other roads investigated by berger while differing in treatment were just as substantial roads paved roads were rare but the via appia offers a remarkable instance of a paved road the stone used in its pavement is of the kind of which millstones are weighed and they are so carefully dressed and adjusted that the road often seems to be solid rock and has proved so indestructible that after two thousand years of continuous use it is still a superb road End of section eighty six this recording is in the public domain recording by monica m c section eighty seven of greece and rome this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by april six zero nine zero california united states of america the World Story, Volume 4, Greece and Rome, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 87. Constantine the Great. Born about 270 A.D. Emperor, 306 through 337, by Eva March Tappan. No one who thought for a moment about the state of the empire could have helped seeing that remedies must be found at once for at least two of its troubles. In the first place, the lives of the emperors must be protected, so they should not be slain at the whim of the soldiers. Second, the barbarians who were pressing upon the boundaries must be thrust back. Diocletian saw this and discovered, or thought he had discovered, a certain remedy. Whether certain or not, it was surely an original one. He chose three generals to aid him in the government. 
to one of these he gave the title of augustus which he himself bore the other two were called caesars his plan was that the four should work together each ruling a division of the empire when an augustus died a caesar was to be promoted to take his place and another caesar to be chosen there were three reasons why this arrangement seemed to diocletian a most excellent plan one was that the succession of the throne was provided for the second was that the four men could divide the realm among them and so it would be well cared for and protected the third was that it would prevent assassination for the murder of one or two or even three of the four would not change the government in the least and it would not be easy to plot to kill four men in different parts of the vast empire at the same moment all went on smoothly for a while but it was soon found that keeping up four courts and four sets of officials was an expensive matter diocletian had taken egypt asia and thrace for his share and had chosen nicodemia near the bosphorus as his capital here he lived in the utmost luxury and splendor the emperor augustus had gone about among the people in familiar fashion he lived simply and had dressed like other well-to-do romans the emperor diocletian dressed in robes of silk and gold and even ornamented his shoes with the most precious gems instead of the people's is meeting their emperor easily and familiarly there were numerous officials to be passed before any one could reach the presence chamber there the visitor was required to throw himself upon the ground at the feet of the ruler moreover this ruler wore a crown a thing which neither julius nor augustus would have ventured to do augustus had kept up all the old forms of the republic and had done his best to make the people feel that they were the real rulers and he was only one of themselves diocletian dropped the old forms and did everything to remove himself from the people and induce them to feel that he was not a mere man but a creature far above them and of a finer clay than they to keep up this expensive court and those of the other rulers required money as has been said before and money must be obtained by increasing the taxes of the people these taxes were already severe and soon there was rebellion on the part of the peasants in gaul these peasants were subdued by arms but they felt that they were burdened beyond what was just and right and they were angry and discontented diocletian was inclined to permit the christians to carry on their worship as they would but galerius one of the caesars was strongly opposed to them at length diocletian yielded to him and passed severe laws against them their churches were leveled to the ground and they themselves were tortured thrown to wild beasts in the arena or put to death in other ways while this persecution was still going on the roman world was amazed to learn that both diocletian and maximian the second augustus had given up the throne and intended to spend the rest of their lives as private citizens diocletian withdrew to dalmatia and there on the shore of the adriatic sea he built himself a palace maximian soon regretted his abdication and wrote to diocletian to ask if they could not by working together get possession of the sovereignty again diocletian gave him little comfort for he replied were you but to come to solona and see the vegetables which i raise in my garden with my own hands you would no longer talk to me of my empire the persecution of the christians continued for seven years after the retirement of diocletian galerius finally published an edict putting an end to it he was then in his last sickness and it is said that in his sufferings he besought the christians to pray to their god for him when diocletian and maximian gave up the throne galerius and constantinius became augusti so far the plan of diocletian had worked smoothly but when constantinius died the soldiers put aside all diocletian's plans and declared that their commander constantinius or constantine should be emperor there were however several other claimants to the throne of whom the most active was maxentius it was several years therefore before constantine became the undisputed ruler of the empire instead of persecuting the christians constantine took the cross for his standard he declared that one day at noon during his struggle with his rival maxentius he saw a cross in the sky above the sun and on it was written in greek in this sign shalt thou conquer 
or as it was translated into Latin, in hoc signo vinces. On the following day he displayed a cross to his soldiers. From its shorter beam hung a banner of purple silk, flashing with jewels and showing images of him and his children. On top of the upright beam was a golden crown, marked Cairo. The Greek letters which stand for the cross and also for the CHR of Christ. On this day he fought with Maxentius, the Battle of Milvian Bridge, one of his most important engagements, and won a great victory. Henceforth his army followed the cross in all their battles. One year later, Constantine published an edict, the Edict of Milan, allowing every one in his realm to practice whatever religion he might choose. Little by little, he gave the Christians more rights. Their numbers increased rapidly, for few people had now any faith in the gods, and they had suffered so much that they were glad to learn of a god in whom they could believe. So it was that the empire gained a new faith. It was not long before it gained a new capital. For Constantine decided to take Byzantium on the Bosphorus for his chief city. He was a wise man, and he had several good reasons for doing this. Perhaps the strongest of all was that he meant to rule the empire without paying any attention to the Roman Senate or the nobles, and this would be much easier to do in the East, where people had always been accustomed to bowing down to their rulers. Another reason was that in Byzantium the emperor would be near his most dangerous enemies the barbarians north of the Danube, and the Persians. He would also be near the mass of his people. Now that Rome ruled Greece and Asia Minor, Byzantium was in a most excellent location for carrying on trade, since all the commerce of the countries around the Black Sea must pass through the Bosphorus. The new city was given the name of Constantinople, or City of Constantine. It is said that more than $12 million was spent on walls, porticos, and aqueducts alone baths, theaters, forum, circus, churches, palaces, all sprang up within a short time. The city was adorned with the works of the greatest artists, for the builder was the master of the world, and he took from the cities of Greece and Asia Minor the finest statues and most perfect ornaments that were in existence. The next thing to do was to make the government as strong as possible, or rather, to prevent anyone's interfering with what Constantine thought best to do for he himself proposed to be the government. He had decided that the surest way to prevent revolts was not to allow any one man to have too much power. Therefore he made many generals, and gave each one fewer soldiers than had been the custom, and he divided the provinces into small districts. This way of ruling prevented rebellions, but it was expensive, for there were very many officials to be paid, and therefore the taxes of the people rose still higher. Those who had fertile lands far enough from the frontiers to be well protected could generally pay what was demanded. But men near the boundaries whose fields were sometimes devastated by barbarians could not pay, and gradually they abandoned their lands. The result of this was that after a while the country at a safe distance from the boundaries was cultivated, but that which was near the borders of the empire was left wild. After Constantine's death, First his sons and then his nephew ruled the empire. This nephew was Julian. He is called the apostate, because he gave up Christianity and tried to bring his people back to the worship of the old gods. The days of the persecutions had passed, but Julian gave the chief offices to those who would carry on the old worship. He forbade Christians to teach in the schools, and he made them rebuild the temples that had been ruined. He made several campaigns against the Persians and in one of these he was fatally wounded. His successor was a Christian. With Julian died the last imperial worshipper of the gods. End of section 87 This recording is in the public domain. Section 88 of Greece and Rome Read for LibriVox.org Rome, Part 9 the Coming of the Barbarians Historical Note For two hundred years Rome had been trying to repel the Germans, who were continually pressing into the empire. Sometimes the Romans drove them away, sometimes they were forced to give them land and accept them as allies. Under Alaric, the Goths actually captured the city. Now came the Huns under Attila. Both Goths and Romans united against them, 
and they were overcome at Chalon in 451 A.D. The Vandals now attacked Rome and plundered the city. Ever since 395 A.D., the empire in the east had had one ruler and the empire in the west another. In the 5th century, the Gothic soldiers demanded land in Italy for homes. They could not be resisted. They made their leader, Odo Acer, ruler of Rome, but he always declared that he held the throne as deputy of the Emperor of the East. Rome then became, in 476 A.D., only a province of the Empire in the East, and this event is called the Fall of the Roman Empire in the West. The Fall of the Eastern Empire took place in 1453, when its capital, Constantinople, was captured by the Turks. End of section 88. This recording is in the public domain. Section 89 of Greece and Rome. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Story, Volume 4, Greece and Rome, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 89, Rome Pays Ransom to Alaric the Goth, 409 A.D., by Wilkie Collins. At the beginning of the 5th century, the Roman Empire had become so weak that it was overrun by swarms of barbarians. Prominent among these was Alaric the Goth, who sacked and burned the city. The following scene is supposed to have taken place while he was encamped in Etruria, just before his capture of Rome. The Editor The embassy had already exhausted its power of intercession, apparently without moving the leader of the Goths from his first pitiless resolution of fixing the ransom of Rome at the price of every possession of value which the city contained. There was a momentary silence now in the great tent. At one extremity of it, congregated in a close and irregular group, stood the wearied and broken-spirited members of the Senate, supported by such of their attendants as had been permitted to follow them. At the other appeared the stately forms of Alaric and the warriors who surrounded him as his council of war. The vacant space in the middle of the tent was strewn with martial weapons, separating the representatives of the two nations one from the other, and thus accidentally, yet palpably, typifying the fierce hostility which had sundered in years past, and was still to sunder for years to come, the people of the north and the people of the south. The Gothic king stood a little in advance of his warriors, leaning on his huge heavy sword. His steady eye wandered from man to man, among the broken-spirited senators contemplating with cold and cruel penetration all that suffering and despair had altered for the worse in their outward appearance. Their soiled robes, their wan cheeks, their trembling limbs, were each marked in turn by the cool sarcastic examination of the conqueror's gaze. Debased and humiliated as they were, there were some among the ambassadors who felt the insult thus silently and deliberately inflicted on them the more keenly for their very helplessness. They moved uneasily in their places, and whispered among each other in low and bitter accents. At last one of their number raised his downcast eyes and broke the silence. The old Roman spirit, which long years of voluntary frivolity and degradation had not yet entirely depraved, flushed his pale, wasted face as he spoke thus. We have entreated, we have offered, we have promised, men can do no more. Deserted by our emperor and crushed by pestilence and famine, nothing is now left to us but to perish in unavailing resistance beneath the walls of Rome. It was in the power of Alaric to win everlasting renown by moderation to the unfortunate of an illustrious nation, but he has preferred to attempt the spoiling of a glorious city and the subjugation of a suffering people, yet let him remember though destruction may sate his vengeance and pillage enrich his hordes, the day of retribution will yet come. There are still soldiers in the empire, and heroes who will lead them confidently to battle, though the bodies of their countrymen lay slaughtered around them in the streets of pillaged Rome. A momentary expression of wrath and indignation appeared on Alaric's features as he listened to this bold speech, but it was almost immediately replaced by a smile of derision. What? Ye still have soldiers before whom the barbarian must tremble for his conquests, he cried. Where are they? Are they on their march, or in ambush, or hiding behind strong walls, or have they lost their way on the road to the Gothic camp? Ha! Here is one of them, he exclaimed, advancing toward an enfeebled and disarmed guard of the Senate, who quailed beneath his fierce glance. Fight, man, he loudly continued, 
fight while there is yet time, for Imperial Rome. Thy sword is gone, take mine, and be a hero again. With a rough laugh echoed by the warriors behind him, he flung his ponderous weapon, as he spoke, toward the wretched object of his sarcasm. The hilt struck heavily against the man's breast, he staggered and fell helpless to the ground. The laugh was redoubled among the Goths, but now their leader did not join in it. His eyes glowed in triumphant scorn, as he pointed to the prostrate Roman, exclaiming, So does the South fall beneath the sword of the North, so shall the Empire bow before the rule of the Goth. Say, as we look on these Romans before us, are we not avenged of our wrongs? They die not fighting on our swords, they live to entreat our pity, as children that are in terror of the whip. He paused. His massive and noble countenance gradually assumed a thoughtful expression. The ambassadors moved forward a few steps, perhaps to make a final entreaty, perhaps to depart in despair, but he signed with his hand in command to them to be silent and remain where they stood. The marauder's thirst for present plunder and the conqueror's lofty ambition of future glory now stirred in strong conflict within him. He walked to the opening of the tent and, thrusting aside its curtain of skins, looked out upon Rome in silence. The dazzling majesty of the temples and palaces of the mighty city as they towered before him, gleaming in the rays of the unclouded sunshine, fixed him long in contemplation. Gradually dreams of future dominion amongst those unrivaled structures, which now waited but his word to be pillaged and destroyed, filled his aspiring soul and saved the city from his wrath. He turned again toward the ambassadors, with a voice and look superior to them as a being of a higher sphere, and spoke thus, When the Gothic conqueror reigns in Italy, the palaces of her ruler will be found standing for the palaces of his sojourn. I will ordain a lower ransom. I will spare Rome. A murmur arose among the warriors behind him. The rapine and destruction which they had eagerly anticipated was denied them for the first time by their chief. As their muttered remonstrances caught his ear, Alaric instantly and sternly fixed his eyes upon them, and, repeating in accents of deliberate command, I will ordain a lower ransom, I will spare Rome, steadily scanned the countenances of his ferocious followers. Not a word of dissent fell from their lips, not a gesture of impatience appeared in their ranks. They preserved perfect silence, as the king again advanced toward the ambassadors and continued, I fix the ransom of the city at five thousand pounds of gold, at thirty thousand pounds of silver. Here he suddenly ceased, as if pondering further on the terms he should exact. The hearts of the Senate, lightened for a moment by Alaric's unexpected announcement that he would moderate his demands, sank within them again, as they thought on the tribute required of them, and remembered their exhausted treasury. But it was no time now to remonstrate or to delay and they answered with one accord, ignorant though they were of the means of performing their promise, the ransom shall be paid. The king looked at them when they spoke, as if in astonishment that men whom he had just deprived of all freedom of choice ventured still to assert it, by intimating their acceptance of terms which they dared not decline. The mocking spirit revived within him while he thus gazed on the helpless and humiliated embassy, and he laughed once more as he resumed, partly addressing himself to the silent array of the warriors behind him. The gold and silver are but the first dues of the tribute. My army shall be rewarded with more than the wealth of the enemy. You men of Rome have laughed at our rough bearskins and our heavy armor. You shall clothe us with your robes of festivity. I will add to the gold and silver of your ransom four thousand garments of silk and three thousand pieces of scarlet cloth. My barbarians shall be barbarians no longer. I will make partitions, epicures, Romans of them. The members of the ill-fated embassy looked up as he paused in mute appeal to the mercy of the triumphant conqueror, but they were not yet to be released from the crushing infliction of his rapacity and scorn. Hold, he cried, I will have more, more still. You are a nation of feasters. We will rival you in your banquets when we have stripped you of your banqueting robes. To the gold, the silver, the silk, and the cloth I will add yet more. Three thousand pounds weight of pepper, your precious merchandise, bought from far countries with your lavish wealth. See that you bring it hither, with the rest of the ransom, to the last grain. The flesh of our beasts shall be seasoned for us like the flesh of yours. He turned abruptly from the senators as he pronounced the last words, and began to speak in jesting tones and in the Gothic language to the council of warriors around him. 
Some of the ambassadors bowed their heads in silent resignation, others, with the utter thoughtlessness of men bewildered by all that they had seen and heard during the interview that was now closed, unhappily revived the recollection of the broken treaties of former days by mechanically inquiring in the terms of past formularies what security the besiegers would require for the payment of their demands. Security, cried Alaric fiercely, instantly relapsing as they spoke into his sterner mood. Behold yonder the future security of the Goths for the faith of Rome. And flinging aside the curtain of the tent, he pointed proudly to the long lines of his camp, stretching around all that was visible of the walls of the fallen city. End of section 89. This recording is in the public domain. Recorded by E. Winters. Section 90 of Greece and Rome. Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. Huns pillaging a French villa. Painting, page 540, by Georges Rochegrosse. French painter, 1859. Early in the fourth century after Christ, the Huns made their appearance in the Western world. These savage horsemen had swept across the plain of Central Asia, and at length had entered Europe. Amid those hordes arose a leader destined to leave a memory in the sagas of the Scandinavian bards, in the Nibelungenlied of the Teutons, and a lurid trail in the annals of the Caesars. He called himself a descendant of the great Nimrod, nurtured in Engadi by the grace of God, king of the Huns, the Goths, the Danes, the Medes, the dread of the world, Attila. A profound politician, he alternately cajoled and threatened the peoples whose conquest he undertook. A true barbarian, no food save flesh and milk passed his lips. He and his men worshipped the mysteriously discovered scimitar of Mars, and from Persia to Gaul, from Finland to the walls of Constantinople, his armies ranged. Ambassadors went from his court to China. The great battle of Chalons in which, aided by the Goths, the dwindling forces of Rome's western empire won their last victory, alone preserved Europe from his yoke. His descendants, mixing with succeeding conquerors, have remained until this day in the land that is called, after their dreaded name, Hungary. From The Russian Road to China, by Lyndon Bates, Jr. Gibbon well pictures the horror that was inspired by their coming. The numbers, the strength, the rapid motions, and the implacable cruelty of the Huns were felt and dreaded and magnified by the astonished Goths, who beheld their villages and fields consumed with flames and deluged with indiscriminate slaughter. To these real terrors they added the surprise and abhorrence which were excited by the shrill voice, the uncouth gestures, and the strange deformity of the Huns. End of section 90. This recording is in the public domain. Section 91 of Greece and Rome. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April 6090, California, United States of America. The World Story, Volume 4, Greece and Rome, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 91, How the Empire Was Saved from the Huns, 450 A.D., by Sir Edward Shepherd Creasy. In the list of the fifteen decisive battles of the world, that of Chalons holds a prominent place. The Goths under Alaric had swept through Rome and Italy. The great Roman Empire was becoming more and more feeble. The question was whether the Huns, heathen savages or the partly Christianized Goths, should inherit its power and become the strongest people of Europe. The people of Chalons answered the question. The editor. The year 445 of our era completed the 12th century from the foundation of Rome, according to the best chronologers. It had always been believed among the Romans that the twelve vultures, which were said to have appeared to Romulus when he founded the city, signified the time during which the Roman power should endure. 
the twelve vultures denoted twelve centuries this interpretation of the vision of the birds of destiny was current among learned romans even when there were yet many of the twelve centuries to run and while the imperial city was at the zenith of its power but as the allotted time drew nearer and nearer to its conclusion and as rome grew weaker and weaker beneath the blows of barbaric invaders the terrible omen was more and more talked and thought of and in attila's time men watched for the momentary extinction of the roman state with the last beat of the last vulture's wing moreover among the numerous legends connected with the foundation of the city and the fratricidal death of ramus there was one most terrible one which told that romulus did not put his brother to death in accident or in hasty quarrel but that he slew his gallant twin with inexorable sin deliberately and in compliance with the warnings of supernatural powers the shedding of a brother's blood was believed to have been the price at which the founder of rome had purchased from destiny for twelve centuries of existence we may imagine therefore with what terror in this the twelve hundredth year after the foundation of rome the inhabitants of the roman empire the tidings that the royal brethren attila and bleda had found a new capital on the danube which was designed to rule over the ancient capital on the tiber and that attila like romulus had consecrated the foundations of his new city by murdering his brother so that for the new cycle of centuries then about to commence dominion had been bought from the gloomy spirits of destiny in favor of the hun by a sacrifice of equal awe and value with that which had formerly obtained it for the roman a strange invitation from a roman princess gave him a pretext for the war and threw an air of chivalric enterprise over his invasion honoria sister of valentinius the third the emperor of the west had sent to attila to offer him her hand and her supposed right to share in the imperial power this had been discovered by the romans and honoria had been forthwith closely imprisoned attila now pretended to take up arms in behalf of his self-promised bride and proclaimed that he was about to march to rome to redress honoria's wrongs ambition and spite against her brother must have been the sole motives that led the lady to woo the royal hun for attila's face and person had all the natural ugliness of his race and the description given of him by a byzantine ambassador must have been well known in the imperial courts it was not until the year four hundred and fifty one that the huns commenced the siege of orleans and during their campaign in eastern gaul the roman general Ateus had strenuously exerted himself in collecting and organizing such an army as might when united to the soldiery of the visigoths be fit to face the huns in the field he enlisted every subject of the roman empire whom patriotism courage and compulsion could collect beneath the standards and round these troops which assumed the once proud title of the legions of rome he arrayed the large forces of barbaric auxiliaries whom pay persuasion or the general hate and dread of the huns brought to the camp of the last of the roman generals king theodoric exerted himself with equal energy orleans resisted her besiegers bravely as in after times the passage of the loire was skilfully defended against the huns and adius and theodoric after much maneuvering and difficulty effected a junction of their armies to the south of that important river on the advance of the alleys upon orleans attila instantly broke up the siege of that city and retreated toward the marne he did not choose to risk a decisive battle with only the central corps of his army against the combined power of his enemies and he therefore fell back upon his base of operations calling in his wings from arras and besenchon and concentrating the whole of the hunnish forces on the vast plains of chalons sur marne a glance at the map will show how scientifically this place was chosen by the hunnish general as the point for his scattered forces to converge upon and the nature of the ground was eminently favorable for the operations of cavalry the arm in which attila's strength peculiarly lay it was during the retreat from orleans that a christian hermit is reported to have approached the hunnish king and said to him thou art the scourge of god for the chastisement of the christians attila instantly assumed the new title of terror which thenceforth became the appellation by which he was most widely and most fearfully known 
the confederate armies of romans and visigoths at last met their great adversary face to face on the ample battleground of the chelons plains Aetius commanded on the right of the allies king theodoric on the left and sagapan king of the alans whose fidelity was suspected was placed purposely in the center and in the very front of the battle attila commanded his center in person at the head of his own countrymen while the ostrogoths the Gepidae, and the other subject alleys of the huns were drawn up on the wings some maneuvering appears to have occurred before the engagement in which Ateus had the advantage inasmuch as he succeeded in occupying a sloping hill which commanded the left flank of the huns attila saw the importance of the position taken by Aetius on the high ground and commenced the battle by a furious attack on this part of the roman line in which he seems to have detached some of his best troops from his center to aid his left the romans having the advantage of the ground repulsed the huns and while the allies gained this advantage on their right their left under king theodoric assailed the ostrogoths who formed the right of attila's army the gallant king was himself struck down by a javelin as he rode onward at the head of his men and his own cavalry charging over him trampled him to death in the confusion but the visigoths infuriated not dispirited by their monarch's fall routed the enemies opposed to them and then wheeled upon the flank of the hunnish center which had been engaged in a sanguinary and indecisive contest with the alans in this peril attila made his center fall back upon his camp and when the shelter of its entrenchments and wagons had once been gained the hunnish archers repulsed without difficulty the charges of the vengeful gothic cavalry aetis had not pressed the advantage which he gained on his side of the field and when night fell over the wild scene of havoc attila's left was still undefeated but his right had been routed and his center forced back upon his camp expecting an assault on the morrow attila stationed his best archers in front of the cars and wagons which were drawn up as a fortification along his lines and made every preparation for a desperate resistance but the scourge of god resolved that no man should boast of the honor of having either captured or slain him he caused to be raised in the center of his encampment a huge pyramid of the wooden saddles of his cavalry round it he heaped the spoils and the wealth that he had won on it he stationed his wives who had accompanied him in the campaign and on the summit attila placed himself ready to perish in the flames and balk the victorious foe of their choicest booty should they succeed in storming his defences but when the morning broke and revealed the extent of the carnage with which the plains were heaped for miles the successful allies saw also and respected the resolute attitude of their antagonist neither were any measures taken to blockade him in his camp and so to exhort by famine that submission which it was too plainly perilous to enforce with the sword attila was allowed to march back the remnants of his army without molestation and even with the semblance of success it is probably that the crafty aetis was unwilling to be too victorious he dreaded the glory which his allies the visigoths had acquired and feared that rome might find a second alaric in prince thorismund who had signalized himself in the battle and had been chosen on the field to succeed his father theodoric he persuaded the young king to return at once to his capital and thus relieved himself at the same time of the presence of a dangerous friend as well as of a formidable though beaten foe attila's attacks on the western empire were soon renewed but never with such peril to the civilized world as had menaced it before his defeat at chalons and on his death two years after that battle the vast empire which his genius had founded was soon discovered by the successful revolts of the subject nations the name of the huns ceased for some centuries to inspire terror in western europe and their ascendancy passed away with the life of the great king by whom it had been so fearfully augmented end of section ninety one this recording is in the public domain Section 92 of Greece and Rome. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Story, Volume 4, 
Greece and Rome, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 92. Peace with the Goths or War, 535 A.D., by Felix Don. At the time of the fall of the empire in the west in 476, Odoacer, leader of the Goths, became patrician and ruled Italy under Zeno, emperor of the east. Odoacer was not of a submissive turn of mind, and he became more and more independent. Now there were also Ostrogoths, or eastern Goths, who dwelt north of the Black Sea. They came down upon Italy and wrested the land from the grasp of Odoacer, and their leader Theodoric became ruler of Italy in his stead. A few years after Theodoric's death, Justinian, emperor of the east, sent the great general Belisarius to drive out the Ostrogoths, then ruled by Totila. They resisted stubbornly and even threatened Byzantium or Constantinople. The Editor on the next day, the Emperor Justinian was standing buried deep in reflection before the tall golden crucifix in his room. The expression of his face was very grave, but without a trace of alarm or doubt. Quiet decision lay upon his features which, else not handsome or noble, at this moment betrayed mental power and superiority. He lifted his eyes almost threateningly to the crucifix. "'God of the cross,' he said, Thou puttest thy faithful servant to a hard proof. It seems to me that I have deserved better. Thou knowest all that I have done to the honor of thy name. Why do not thy strokes fall upon thine enemies, the heathens and barbarians? Why not? He was interrupted in his soliloquy by the entrance of his chamberlains and wardrobe keepers. Justinian exchanged his mourning garment for the robes of state. His slaves served him upon their knees. He apparelled himself in a tunic of white silk reaching to the knees, embroidered with gold on both sides and confined by a purple girdle. The tightly fitting hose were also of silk of the same color. His slaves threw over his shoulders a splendid mantle of a lighter shade of purple, with a broad hem of golden thread upon which red circles and symbolic animal forms, embroidered in green silk, alternated with each other but the pearls and precious stones which were lavishly strewn over it rendered the design almost invisible and made the mantle so heavy that the assistance of the train-bearers must have been indeed a welcome relief. On each of his arms the emperor wore three broad golden bracelets. The wide crown was made of massive gold, arched over with two rows of pearls. His mantle was fastened on the shoulder with a costly brooch of large precious stones. The scepter-keeper put into the emperor's hand a golden staff the length of a man, at the top of which was a globe made out of a single large emerald and surmounted with a gold cross. The emperor grasped it firmly and rose from his seat. A slave offered him the thick-soled buskins which he usually wore in order to increase his height. No, today I need no buskins, said Justinian, and left the room. Down the stairs of the lions, so called from the twenty-four immense marble lions which guarded the twelve steps, and which had been brought from Carthage by Belisarius, the emperor descended to a lower story and entered the hall of Jerusalem. This hall derived its name from the porphyry columns, the onyx vases, the golden tables, and the numerous golden vessels which, arranged on pedestals and along the walls, were said to have formerly decorated the temple of Jerusalem. These treasures had been taken to Rome by Titus after the destruction of Jerusalem. From Rome, the sea king Geyseric had taken them on his dragon ships, together with the empress Eudoxia, to his capital Carthage, and now Belisarius had brought them from Carthage to the emperor of the east. The cupola of the hall representing the firmament was wrought in mosaic. Costly blue stones formed the groundwork in which were inlaid besides the sun, the moon, the eye of God, the lamb, the fish, the birds, the palm, the vine, the unicorn, and many other symbols of Christianity, the whole zodiac and innumerable stars of massive gold. The cost of the cupola alone was estimated as high as the whole income of the taxes on property in all the empire for forty-five years. Opposite the three great arches of the entrance, which were closed by curtains, it was the only entrance to the hall, and were guarded outside by a threefold line of imperial bodyguards, the golden shields, stood, at the bottom of the semicircular hall, the elevated throne of the emperor, and below it, on the left, the seat of the empress. 
when justinian entered the hall with a numerous retinue of palace officials all the assembly consisting of the highest dignitaries of the realm threw themselves upon their faces in humble prostration the empress alone rose bowed deeply and crossed her arms upon her bosom her dress was exactly similar to that of her husband her white stole was also covered with a purple mantle but without hem she carried a very short scepter of ivory the emperor cast a slight but contemptuous glance at the patriarchs archbishops bishops patricians and senators who above thirty in number occupied a row of gilded chairs set in a semicircle and provided with cushions he then passed through the middle of the hall and ascended his throne with a quick firm step twelve of the chief officers of the palace stood upon the steps of the two thrones holding white wands in their hands a blast of trumpets gave the signal to the kneeling assembly to rise reverend bishops and worthy senators began the emperor we have called you together to ask your advice in an affair of great moment but why is our magister militum per orientum narcis absent he returned only yesterday from persia he is sick and confined to bed answered the usher where is our treasurer of the sacri palati trebonius he has not yet returned from his embassy to Beritus about the code where is belisarius our magister militum per orientum extraordinum he does not reside in byzantium but in asia in the red house at Sicy. he keeps too far apart in the red house it displeases us why does he avoid our presence he could not be found not even in the house of his freedman photius he has gone hunting to try the persian hunting leopards said leo the assistant huntsman he is never to be found when wanted and is always present when not wanted i am not content with belisarius hear now what has lately been communicated to me by letter afterwards you shall hear the report of the envoys themselves you know that we have allowed the war in italy to die away for we had other occupation for our generals you know that the barbarian king sued for peace and the quiet possession of italy we rejected it at that time awaiting more convenient circumstances the goth has answered not in words but by very insolent deeds no one in byzantium knows of it we kept the news to ourselves thinking it impossible or at least exaggerated but we find that it is true and now you shall hear it and advise upon it the barbarian king has sent a fleet and an army to dalmatia with great haste and secrecy the fleet entered the harbor of Macurum near salona the army landed and carried the fortress by storm in a similar way the fleet surprised the coast town of la retia claudianus our governor at salona sent numerous and strongly manned vessels to retake the town from the goths but a naval combat took place and the goth duke githerus beat our squadron so thoroughly that he made prizes of all the vessels without exception and carried them victoriously into the harbor of loritia further the gothic king equipped a second fleet of four hundred large ships at kentum calais it was formed for the most part of byzantine vessels which sent from the east to sicily to reinforce belisarius in ignorance that the italian harbors were again in possession of the goths had been taken by a gothic earl grippa with all their crews and freights the goal of this second fleet was unknown but suddenly the barbarian king appeared with the fleet before belgium the fortress in the extreme southern part of brutia which place we had won on our first landing in italy and had not since lost after a brave resistance the garrison of herulians and massagate were forced to capitulate but the tyrant totila sailed immediately to sicily to wrest from us that earliest of belisarius's conquests he beat the roman governor dementiolus who met him in the open field and in a short time took possession of the whole island with the exception of messana panormus and syracuse which were enabled to hold out by reason of their formidable fortifications a fleet which i sent to attempt the reconquest of sicily was dispersed by a storm a second was driven by the northwest wind to the peloponnesus at the same time a third fleet of triremes equipped by this indefatigable king and commanded by earl haduswinth sailed for corsica and sardinia the first of these islands presently fell to the goths after the imperial garrison of the capital city of alexia had been beaten before the walls 
The rich Corsican, Furius Ahala, to whom the greater part of the island belongs, was absent in India, but his stewards and tenants had been ordered in case of a landing of the Goths in no wise to oppose them, but to aid them to the best of their power. From Corsica the barbarians turned to Sardinia. Here near Caralis they beat the troops which our magister Militum had sent from Africa to conquer the island, and took Caralis as well as Sulki, Castratahani, and Tures. The Goths then settled down in both islands and treated them as permanently acquired dependencies of the Gothic kingdom, placing Gothic commanders in all the towns and raising taxes according to Gothic law. Strange to say, these taxes are far less heavy than ours, and the inhabitants shamelessly declare that they would rather pay the barbarians fifty than ninety to us. But all this was not enough. Sailing to the northeast from Sicily, the tyrant Totila united his squadron with a fourth fleet under Earl Thea off Hydrus. Part of this united fleet under Earl Thorismith sailed to Kakaira, took possession of that island, and thence conquered all the surrounding islands. But not yet enough. The tyrant Totila and Earl Thea already attack the mainland of our empire. A murmur of terror interrupted the august speaker. Justinian resumed in an angry voice. They have landed in the harbor of Epirus Vetus, carried the towns of Nicopolis and Anchises southwest of the ancient Dodona, and taken a great many of our ships along the coast. All this may excite your indignation against the insolence of these barbarians, but you have now to hear what will move you in a different way. Briefly, according to reports which reached me yesterday, it is certain that the Goths are in full march upon Byzantium itself. At this, some of the senators sprang to their feet. They intend a double attack. The united fleet commanded by Duke Guntherus, Earls Marcia, Grippa, and Thorismith has beaten, in a combat of two days' duration, the fleet which protected our island provinces and has driven it into the straits of Sestos and Abydos. Their army under Totila and Teia is marching across Thessaly by way of Dodona against Macedonia. Thessalonica is already threatened. Earl Teia has raised to the ground the new wall, which we had there erected. The road to Byzantium is open, and no army stands between us and the barbarians. All our troops are on the Persian frontier, and now listen to what the Goth proposes. Fortunately, God has befooled and blinded him to our weakness. He again offers us peace under the former conditions, with one exception that he now intends to keep possession of Sicily. But he will evacuate all his other conquests if we acknowledge his rule in Italy. As I have no means, neither fleets nor cohorts, to stop his victorious course, I have, for the present, demanded an armistice. This he has agreed to on condition that afterwards peace is to be concluded on the former conditions. I have agreed to this. And pausing, the emperor cast a searching glance at the assembly and looked askance at the empress. The assembly was evidently relieved. The empress closed her eyes in order to conceal their expression. Her small hand grasped convulsively the arm of her throne. But I agreed to it with the reservation that I should first hear the opinion of my wife, who has lately been an advocate for peace, and that also of my wise senate. I added that I myself was inclined to peace. All present looked more at ease. And I believed that I could tell beforehand what would be the decision of my counselors. Upon this understanding, the horsemen of Earl Teia unwillingly halted at Thessalonica. Unfortunately, they had already taken prisoner the bishop of that city, but they have sent him here with other prisoners, carrying messages and letters. You shall hear them, and then decide. Reflect that if we refuse to conclude a peace, the barbarians will soon stand before our gates, and that we are only asked to yield that which the empire had given up long ago, and which Belisarius in two campaigns failed to reconquer. Italia, let the envoys approach. Through the arches of the entrance, the bodyguard now led in several men in clerical, official, and military costume. Trembling and sighing, they threw themselves at the feet of Justinian. Even tears were not wanting. At a sign from the emperor, they rose again and stood before the steps of the throne. "'Your petitions and lamentations,' said the emperor, "'I received yesterday. Proto-notary, now read to us the letter from the bishop of Nicopolis and the wounded governor of Illyricum, since then the latter has succumbed to his wounds. The proto-notary read, 
To Justinius, the unconquerable emperor of the Romani, Dorotheus, bishop of Nicopolis, and Nazaris, governor of Illyricum, the place whence we write these words will be the best proof of their gravity. We write on board the royal barge of the Gothic king, the Italia. When you read these words, you will have already learned the defeat of the fleet and the loss of the islands, the storming of the new wall, and the destruction of the army of Illyricum. Quicker than the messengers and fugitives from these battles have the Gothic pursuers reached us. The Gothic king has conquered and spared Nicopolis. Earl Teia has conquered and burnt Anchises. I, Nazares, have served in the army for thirty years, and never have I seen such an attack as that in which Earl Teia overthrew me at the gates of Anchises. They are irresistible, these Goths. Their horsemen sweep the country from Thessalonica to Philippi. The Goths in the heart of Illyricum! That has not been heard of for sixty years, and the king has sworn to return every year until he has peace or Byzantium. Since he won Kerkyra and the Cybotes, he stands upon the bridge of your empire. Therefore, as God has touched the heart of this king, as he offers peace at a moderate price, the price of what he has actually gained, we beseech you in the name of your trembling subjects and of your smoking towns to conclude a peace. Save us and save Byzantium. For your generals, Belisarius and Narsus, will rather be able to stop the course of the sun and the blowing of the wind than to stay King Totila and the terrible Teia. They are prisoners, said the emperor, interrupting the reader, and perhaps they speak in fear of death. Now it is your turn to speak, venerable bishop of Thessalonica, you, Anatolius, commander of Dodona, and you, Parmenio, brave captain of the Macedonian Lancers, you are safe here under our imperial protection, but you have seen the barbarian generals. What do you advise? At this the aged bishop of Thessalonica again threw himself upon his knees and cried, Emperor of the Romani, the barbarian king, Totila, is a heretic and accursed forever. Yet never have I seen a man more richly endowed with all Christian virtues. Do not strive with him. In the other world he will be damned forever, but I cannot comprehend it. On earth God blesses all his ways. He is irresistible. I understand it well, interposed Anatolius. It is his craft which wins for him all hearts. The deepest hypocrisy, a power of dissimulation, which outdoes all our much-renowned and defamed Grecian cunning. The barbarian plays the part of a philanthropist so excellently that he almost deceived me, until I reflected that there was no such thing in the world as the love which this man pretends with all the art of a comedian. He acts as if he really felt compassion for his conquered enemies. He feeds the hungry, he divides the booty, your tax money, O Emperor, amongst the country people, whose fields have been devastated by the war. Women who had fled into the woods and were found by his horsemen, he returns uninjured to their husbands. He enters the villages to the sound of a harp, played by a beautiful youth who leads his horse. Do you know what is the consequence? Your own subjects, Emperor of the Romani, rebel to him, and deliver your officers, who have obeyed your severe laws, into his hands. Peasants and farmers of Dodona did so by me. This barbarian is the greatest comedian of the century, and the clever hypocrite understands many other things besides fighting. He has entered into an alliance against you with the distant Persians, with your inveterate enemy Kosroas. We ourselves saw the Persian ambassador ride out of his camp toward the east. When Anatolius had ceased speaking, the Macedonian captain gave his report, which ran, Ruler of the Romani, since Earl Teia gained the high road of Thessalonica, Nothing stands between your throne and his battle axe but the walls of this city. He who stormed the new wall eight times in succession and carried it at the ninth attempt will carry the walls of Byzantium at the tenth. You can only repel the Goths if you have sevenfold their number. If you have it not, then conclude a peace. Peace, peace, we beseech you in the name of your trembling provinces of Epirus, Thessaly, and Macedonia. Deliver us from the Goths. Let us not again see the days of Alaric and Theodoric. Peace with the Goths! Peace! Peace! All of the envoys, bishops, officials, and warriors sank upon their knees with a cry of peace. The effect on the assembly was fearful. It had often happened that Persians and Saracens in the east, Moors in the south, and Bulgarians and Slavonians in the northwest had made incursions into the country, slaying and plundering, 
and had sometimes beaten the troops sent against them, and escaped unhindered with their booty. But that Grecian islands should be permanently conquered by the enemy, that Grecian harbors should be won and governed by barbarians, and that the high road to Byzantium should be dominated by Goths was unheard of. With dismay the senators thought of the days when Gothic ships and Gothic armies should overrun all the Grecian islands, and repeatedly storm the walls of Byzantium, only to be stopped by the fulfillment of all their demands. They already seemed to hear the battle axe of the Black Earl knocking at their gates. Quietly and searchingly did Justinian look into the rows of anxious faces on his right and on his left. "'You have heard,' he then began, "'what church, state, and army desire. Now I ask your opinion. We have already accomplished an armistice. Shall war or shall peace ensue? One word will by peace. Our assent to the cession of Italy, which is already lost. Whoever among you is in favor of war, let him hold up his hand.' No one moved, for the senators were afraid for Byzantium, and they had no doubt of the emperor's inclination for peace. "'My senate unanimously declares for peace. I knew it beforehand,' said Justinian, with a singular smile. "'I am accustomed always to follow the advice of my wise counselors and of my empress.' At this word Theodora started from her seat and threw her ivory scepter from her with such violence that it flew far across the hall." The senators were startled. "'Then farewell,' cried the empress. "'Farewell to what has ever been my pride, my belief in Justinian and his imperial dignity. Farewell, all share in the cares and honors of the state. Alas, Justinian, alas for you and me, that I must hear such words from your lips.' And she hid her face in her purple mantle, in order to conceal the agony which her excitement caused her. The emperor turned towards her. "'What?' The Augusta, my wife, who since Belisarius returned to Byzantium for the second time, has always advocated peace, with a short exception. Does she now, in such a time of danger, advise war? cried Theodora, uncovering her face, and in her intense earnestness she looked more beautiful than she ever did when smiling in playful sport. Must I, your wife, remind you of your honor? Will you suffer these barbarians to fix themselves firmly in your empire and force you to their will? You who dreamt of the re-establishment of the empire of Constantine, you Justinian who have taken the names of Persicus, Vandalicus, Alaticus, and Gothicus, you will allow this Gothic stripling to lead you by the beard whithersoever he will? Are you not the same Justinian who had been admired by the world, by Byzantium, and by Theodora? Our admiration was in error. On hearing these words, the patriarch of Byzantium, he still believed that the emperor had irrevocably decided upon peace, took courage to oppose the empress, who did not always hit upon the strict definition of orthodoxy of which he was the representative. What, he said, the august lady advises bloody war, verily the holy church has no need to plead for the heretic, notwithstanding the new king is wonderfully mild towards the Catholics in Italy, and we can wait for more favorable times until— no, priest, interrupted Theodora. The outraged honor of this empire can wait no longer. Justinian! He remained obstinately silent. Oh, Justinian, let us not be deceived in you. You dare not let that be wrung from you by defiance, which you refuse to humble petitions. Must I remind you that once before your wife's advice and will and courage saved your honor? Have you forgotten the terrible rebellion of the Nica? Have you forgotten how the united parties of the circus, of the frantic mob of Byzantium, attacked this house? Flames arose, the cry of down with the tyrants rang in our ears. All your counselors advised flight or compliance. All these reverend bishops and wise senators and even your generals, for Narcissus was away in distant Asia and Belisarius was shut up by the rebels in the palace on the shore. All were in despair. Your wife Theodora was the only hero by your side. If you had yielded or fled your throne, your life, and most certainly your honor would have been lost. You hesitated. You were inclined to fly. Remain and die if need be, I then said, but die in the purple. And you remained, and your courage saved you. You awaited death upon your throne with me at your side, and God sent Belisarius to our relief. I speak the same now. Do not yield, Emperor of the Romani. Do not yield to the barbarians. Stand firm. 
Let the ruins of the Golden Gate overwhelm you if the acts of the terrible Goth can force it, but die an emperor. This purple is stained by the immeasurable insolence of these Germans. I throw it from me, and I swear by the wisdom of God never will I again resume it until the empire is rid of the Goths. And she tore off her mantle and threw it down upon the steps of the throne, but then, greatly exhausted, she was on the point of sinking back into her seat when Justinian caught her in his arms and pressed her to his bosom. Theodora, he cried, my glorious wife, you need no purple on your shoulders. Your spirit is clothed in purple. You alone understand Justinian. War and destruction to the Goths! At this spectacle, the trembling senators were overwhelmed with terror and astonishment. Yes, wise fathers, cried the emperor, turning to the assembly. This time you were too clever to be men. It is indeed an honor to be called Constantino's successor, but it is no honor to be your master. Our enemies, I fear, are right. Constantine only planted here the dead mummy of Rome, but the soul of Rome had already fled. Alas for the empire! Were it free or a republic, it would now have sunk in shame forever. It must have a master who, when like a laser horse it threatens to sink into the quagmire, pulls it up by the rein, a strong master with bridle, whip, and spurs. At this moment a little crooked man, leaning on a crutch, forced his way into the hall and limped up the steps to the throne. Emperor of the Romans, he began, when he rose from his obeisance, a report reached me on my bed of pain of all that the barbarians had dared and of what was going on here. I gathered all my strength and dragged myself here with difficulty, for by one word from you I must learn whether I have been a fool from the beginning in holding you to be a great ruler in spite of many weaknesses, whether I shall throw your marshal's staff into the deepest well or still carry it with pride. Speak only one word, war or peace. War! War! cried Justinian. End of section 92. This recording is in the public domain. Recorded by E. Winters. Section 93 of Greece and Rome. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Justinian in Council by Jean Joseph Benjamin Constant. France, 1845 to 1902. Painting, page 548. In 330 A.D., Constantine the Great selected the old town of Byzantium as the capital of the empire. Mighty walls, splendid palaces, baths, theaters, porticos, and hippodrome rose as if by magic. The art treasures of Greece and Asia were poured into this new capital. The love for simplicity and exquisiteness of form soon vanished, and the demand for richness of material took its place. Statues of marble and bronze no longer satisfied the desires of the rulers. All must be of gold or silver. Even the roof of the imperial palace is said to have been decorated with mosaics of gold and precious stones. Tasteless but costly ornamentation prevailed. During the reign of Justinian, this gorgeousness was at its height. He added to the glories of the city by building the famous church of St. Sophia. By means of his commander, Belisarius, he defended his empire from the Persians, and recovered Italy from the Goths, and Africa from the Vandals. The lasting glory of his reign, however, is due far less to his victories than to the digest of Roman law, which he caused to be made. From the enormous mass of material he had two books prepared, the first containing the statute law, the second the pendects, that is, the decisions and opinions of former magistrates and lawyers. To accomplish this undertaking, selections had to be made from more than two thousand volumes. A third book was The Institutes, an abridgment of the laws in elementary form for use in the law schools. A fourth, the new code, was composed of the laws of modern date, including Justinian's own edicts. End of section 93. This recording is in the public domain. Section 94 of Greece and Rome. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sonia. The World Story, Volume 4, Greece and Rome. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 94. Belisarius. 505 to 565 A.D. By Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Justinian was a thorough statesman, but he was not without weaknesses. As the fame of Belisarius increased, the jealous fears of the emperor increased, and at length he recalled his great general from Italy. The command of the forces in the west was given to Narses, who succeeded in regaining Italy and expelling the Goths in 553. There is probably no real ground for the truth of the legend on which Longfellow's poem is founded that the deposed general was blind and a beggar, but the jealousy and ingratitude of his emperor is undoubted. The Editor I am poor and old and blind. The sun burns me, and the wind blows through the city gate, and covers me with dust from the wheels of the august Justinian the Great. It was for him I chased the Persians over wild and waste, as general of the East. Night after night I lay in their camps of yesterday. Their forage was my feast. For him, with sails of red and torches at masthead, piloting the great fleet, I swept the Afric coasts, and scattered the vandal hosts like dust in a windy street. For him I won again the Orsonian realm and reign, Rome and Parthenope, and all the land was mine from the summits of Apennine to the shores of either sea. For him, in my feeble age, I dared the battle's rage to save Byzantium's state. When the tents of Zabergan, like snowdrifts, overran the road to the Golden Gate. And for this, for this, behold, infirm and blind and old, with grey uncovered head, beneath the very arch of my triumphal march, I stand and beg my bread. Methinks I still can hear, sounding distinct and near, the Vandal monarch's cry, as captive and disgraced, with majestic step he paced. All, all is vanity. Ah, vainest of all things is the gratitude of kings. The plaudits of the crowd are but the clatter of feet at midnight in the street, hollow and restless and loud. But the bitterest disgrace is to see forever the face of the monk of Ephesus. The unconquerable will this too can bear. I still am Belisarius. End of section 94 End of The World Story A History of the World in Story, Song and Art Volume 4 Greece and Rome Edited by Eva March Tappan.